Um, welcome to Brains at Bay. I'm Charmaine from Nementa, and today we'll be focusing on the topic of grid cells. So just for a little bit of context first, we started Brains at Bay two years ago, where we discussed a series of topics at the intersection of neuroscience and machine learning. Our main goal is to foster the study and development of machine learning algorithms that are inspired by neuroscience research. So we're super excited to have everyone here today. Each talk will be around 30 minutes and then there'll be a Q&A session towards the end. So for all our attendees, feel free to ask your questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. And in case you miss some of this meetup, we'll be recording this and posting this on our YouTube channel. I'll add the link to our meetup page once the video is uploaded. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the baton to Marcus to introduce our speakers and the wondrous world of grid cells. Great. Uh, yeah. So today, uh, I guess I guess I'll introduce. I was going to do all the speakers uh, before they talked, but I'll do, just do a brief intro since we haven't mentioned them yet. Uh, I'm Marcus. I'm a researcher at Numenta, and uh, so I'm coming in with a background in computer science. Uh, but I've been immersed in neuroscience and machine learning for the past six or seven years. Um, our second speaker is going to be James Whittington, uh, who is a postdoctoral research associate at Oxford, uh, and he did his PhD at Oxford, where he worked with uh, Rafael Bogac. Uh, who who is presented he, he at just, one of these? What was that? He's just recently been promoted to be a, a Henry Wellcome Fellow from the Wellcome Trust now. Excellent. Hooray. <laughs> uh, and and uh, so in his PhD, he was co-advised by Tim Behrens and Rafael Bogach. And Tim is here today. You just heard him speak. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll say, well, well I'll, I'll do a little more intro right before the speeches. So, and then our other speaker is Kim Stackenfeld, who's a research scientist at DeepMind. Uh, she did her PhD at Princeton, where she worked with Matt Botvinnik and Sam Gershman. And uh, so I will go ahead and get started with my talk, which is really more of a two-part talk. It's more like two talks in one. And so I'm going to start presenting. So yes, I'm doing a two-part talk. And since I'm basically doing two talks in one, um, I'm probably going to use most of the 30 minutes. So questions are welcome. But like, discussion more discussion topics it'll help me if those get saved till the end but clarifying questions are totally fine so the first half of this is going to be an introduction to grid cells since the audience for this uh for this meeting is sort of a mix of neuroscience and machine learning people and maybe just people who are generally interested i'm going to try to give you just a basic intuition of grid cells and some people are going to be coming here wondering why they should care about them especially like machine learning people wondering uh, why, what, what ideas do grid cells bring to the table? And I'm not going to answer that question, at least not immediately, because the field's still figuring out what these cells do, like what their, what their actual role in the brain is. That's not a settled question. And in the second half of the talk, I will adopt one point of view on that. But the first is more just designed to like give you the raw data in some sense, uh, so that you can then receive a series of views from me and the other speakers. And so uh, I will go ahead and jump into part one of this, an introduction to grid cells. And uh, so some of the people here will have seen the video I'm about to show many times. Um, this video, is, I think, is an effective way of, of getting a first glance at what a grid cell is. Uh, in this video, I'm going to show a, a rat running around a box, a one meter by one meter box. And uh, in the video, they're recording a single neuron from a part of the brain called the entorhinal cortex, which is an area that all mammals have. And so getting to the video here, I'm gonna do the zoom thing where I optimize for video just a second. Okay, this should work. So this rat's running around, they're recording a neuron and each of these white diamonds indicates where this neuron spiked or where, rather where the rat was standing when the neuron spiked. And they sped up the video. You can even see a person dropping food in there the, to kind of force a random walk of the animal. Uh, so so uh, yeah, the rats foraging for food. And at first the dots might've seemed a little bit randomly placed, uh, but now once you've seen it kind of averaged over time, you see that the, the dots are not random. They, uh, the, the spike locations all occurred at the corners of this sort of lattice, the set of points that is a, sort of, uh, equally separated. You can see equilateral triangles roughly, or you can see a, a hexagon shape here. And so um, when people, when, when, the, when the Mosers, when their group saw this, I mean, these neurons didn't have a name and they saw that that looks like a grid. Uh, and so they called them grid cells. And I'm gonna move into a more cartoon view of them first. I'm gonna change zoom back so that the video is, uh, so that it's back to normal. And uh, 
So to give more of a cartoon view of grid cells, just so we can talk about a couple of the properties, a single grid cell fires at multiple equally spaced locations when the rat is at uh, multiple, e multiple equally spaced locations. And uh, in this picture though, we're just recording one neuron and, and we're just putting like one electrode into one part of the entorhinal cortex. And the next slide I'm gonna talk about, if you record different points along the entorhinal cortex, what you see. And what you see, so this is the same picture, but multiple electrodes, uh, ac actual images of electrodes, <laughs> uh, just kidding. And, uh, and what you see when you record these neurons is um, you get grid cells, uh, but the grids are different. Uh, the grids are, they have different spatial periods or scales. We're on one end of this, uh, one end of this, uh, this uh, of the entorhinal cortex, the dorsal end of it. You get these small grids or these small period grids. And on the ventral end, you get these larger ones or that, that seem to have a larger scale. And so this is one of the interesting properties of grid cells. A second interesting thing to look at is if you look at uh, it, go back to looking at just one electrode, uh, but look at the, the local population of cells and, and what the other cells nearby are doing. And what you find there, so here I'm going to show empirical data where they did that uh, from the original grid cell paper, where they record three different neurons uh, at, a, at a single electrode. And the empirical data here, on the left you see uh, a, the, a blue cell, uh, the, the blue cells plotted, its firing locations are firing in a grid, a red cell is firing in a grid, this green cell is firing in a grid. And they all in the sense have, are the same grid, just shifted or translated. And so this is the property that you see when you look at a bunch of locally clustered neurons is they're the, they're the, the same grid, but translated. And uh, you get the sense that, so looking at, um, looking at how there's still some like uncovered space, you get the sense that if you record enough neurons, you're gonna totally cover that space. You're gonna have every location correspond to a grid cell. And, and going back to my cartoon drawings, uh, in, in this cartoon version, it took 16 cells. For I, I, took, I, I just started adding grids until it covered the space. And um, the, a point that I wanna make here, so I've drawn this arrow around, I've drawn this box around this rhombus, this, uh, this parallelogram. And I want you to have this second way of thinking about grid cells where you can think about it as a hexagonal grid, uh, or you can think about this rhombus that I've drawn, this this parallelogram, and uh, and to just really zero in on, really narrow in and focus on this rhombus. A way, a valid way of thinking about grid cells is that a population of cells seems to be tracking the location of a rat, and I'll just replace this with a different cartoon version of a rhombus, just so I can make the point a little bit more clearly. So you have it's like it's like you have a bump of activity that moves through this population. Um, regardless of how they work from the outside, this is, seems to be how they look. It's not clear if the system actually works by moving a bump through the population, but from the outside, that's what it appears to be doing. And uh, so, so what you can picture is that as a rat is moving, this bump of activity is also moving. And, and I've, I've drawn it so that the bump of activity sort of straddles the side to just give you the, um, to, to make it clear that there's this wraparound thing that happens so that when the bump goes off one side, it comes in the other side. And uh, so, so if you think about this for a second, is if, if the rat were to run directly to the right, this bump would move directly to the right and it would pass through the same population of cells again and again and again. And that would lead to each of those cells having a grid-like field. So the term for this set of cells that has the same grid is a grid cell module. Uh, and, and also you'll hear people talk about it as a torus. Topologically, this is a torus. And um, sometimes when people hear the word torus, they picture a donut, which is right, I guess. But for me, that mental image doesn't work as well. For me, a, a torus is, uh, is like, a, a, like a square uh, that, where the edges wrap around, sort of like the old video game asteroids, where the ship goes off the side, comes on the other side. That's kind of what's going on here with the bump, except it's, it's a rhombus shaped game of asteroids that a bump is going through. And uh, I'll, I'll show one more uh, interesting property of grid cells that's just useful for um, making sense of what they're doing. Um, for one thing, after a rat comes back into a room where it's been before, if it comes back to an environment it's been before, grid cells fire consistently with where they did before. Uh, but a, a, an interesting property that uh, I think this, this was an elegant little study that, sh that showed um, 
if you if you now put the rat in another room that's similar but sufficiently different, um, the grid cells will map onto the room differently. Uh, but they do maintain their like their their relationship. Like this cell will always fire next to this cell. Uh, the the this cell will fire next to this cell. Uh, but but you get this translation of them as a, as a whole. And in the study, they had to change the colors of the walls and they had to change the odor of the room. And those two changes combined would cause the grids to shift like this. Uh, but at the same time, making just one of those changes often wasn't enough. So so it seems like the system is doing some amount of generalization or reusing of its representation scheme, uh, but some amount of uh, like splitting as well. And as I mentioned, the relative firing of the cells stays constant. It's, there's always, you get this sort of rhombus where the relationships are the same within them. And to say a little bit more about grid cells though, and to maybe uh, emphasize their importance is that they're not just used for representing cell location. It seems to be roughly that uh, no matter what task this rat, a rat is engaged in, uh, the grid cells are participating somehow. And uh, so, so in this first set of studies I've listed, the literally the exact same grid cells are, are found to do other things, like a rat's pulling a lever, listening to a pitch, and then suddenly the cells are representing the pitch that it is playing. Uh, and second, there's something, some relation to them tracking time as well. Uh, and then I'm going to bring up this uh, a second set of studies where the, the, the distinction I'll make here is that um, this is another case where grid cells are being used, but it may be a different population of cells. It's not clear whether it's the same cells being used for these or a different one. And uh, so one important of these to, to focus on is, first of all, primates like humans and non-humans uh, have grid cells, uh, but a lot of the ones that have been found uh, track the viewed location. As you look around, you get these hexagonal firing fields for where you're looking. And a second study I'll point out, uh, so some of these people are here today. So uh, this is definitely the paper that wins the award for the neuroscience paper I've talked about most at parties. Uh, so uh, this, this was a truly surprising thing. So if humans are trained, if, if humans practice um, manipulating a virtual bird, uh, changing its neck length and its leg length, um, grid cells start to adopt the, um, the representation scheme of responding like a grid in this space of neck length and leg length. This is based on fMRI evidence, but it's a pretty strong signal. Like that is, it's a pretty, it's pretty clear. It seems to be what's going on here. So, so this is one of like the big fun results. So Tim is here today. So that, that this is cool. Uh, so suffice to say, um, grid cells seem to be used for a lot of things. And now I'm moving into sort of stating points of view on, on them. Um, I, in my mind, I kind of organize views on grid cell into two general clusters of views. And in, in one of them, um, one of them, it's more of part of a memory system. Uh, and in these, in these types of models, by the way, um, this slide does not list all of the theoretical work on grid cells, but I'm really focused on the, the high level ones, the, the, the types of models that are using grid cells to solve some problem. So, um, so I'm leaving a lot of theoretical work on grid cells out. Uh, in this first view, um, there's, a, there's a real emphasis on learned associations. And these types of model, um, the system you know, updates the grid cells, forms an association, updates the grid cells, forms an association. They do that kind of thing. Uh, a, a second class of models, uh, uh, rather than treating grid cells as like this blank canvas for associating things with, they uh, they encode information directly. And, and some people, I'd say one example, I think a lot of people when they first see grid cells, they see immediate analogies to the Fourier transform. And so one this that would be one example of the second view where if you were to take an animal's environment and almost think of it as a 2D image, and you encode that using a Fourier uh, basis, uh, you get something kind of grid-like. And so that's that's one example of such a view. Um, and so so the speakers today, uh, I'd say the first two mostly fall into this top one. This is just my mental model. And I think Kim falls more into the latter. She's not the Fourier view, but I think that this sort of reflects more of the mindset. And so you get you'll you'll get to get a sampling of all of this today. In my mind, uh, something that's common to both of these views is that grid cells participate in, um, and like their importance is the fact that they can be updated. 
Other representation schemes might optimize for other things like reconstruction error. The grid cells sort of optimize for being able to be updated. And uh, so the rest of this talk though, I'm adopting view one, uh, ma mainly because it's, it's, the, um, it's the, where most of my work has been. Uh, and uh, so, so, but I'm still very intrigued by the second view. It's just more of my work is on the first one. And uh, so I'm jumping into the second part. Uh, so I'm taking off one hat and putting on uh, a different hat. Now I'm suddenly I'm, I'm confident of grid cells being used in a memory. And I'm gonna talk about that <laughs> to you. So uh, in this, I, I titled this quickly forming structured memories. So I'm putting an emphasis on the quickness here. And, it, and I'll tell you what I mean there. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on two operations that are real that are important for mapping. And uh, so the first of these operations, and by the way, we've been working on these for over the years, but I'm going to present a previous version of them and then where my head's at right now. Uh, the, so this first operation is that of learning what I'm calling here a sensory map of uh, so if it, you can imagine if a rat is walking around and it's noting what it senses at different locations, and it associates what it senses with those locations. That's sort of learning a sensory map, forming a map of this object. So I have these two objects, these two parts. Uh, one is a triangle, one is a pentagon. And so forming different maps uh, through this sort of brute force way of moving around and learning what you sense. Then the second part, and this is where the speed comes in, is detecting arrangements of maps. So imagine a rat, uh, it has learned maps of these two objects. And now it's able to say, uh, okay, I see a triangle, I see a pentagon, and here's the arrangement of them, done. It, it just sees them and quickly learns this, rather than having to go through a brute force process of moving around and, and associating sensory input. Uh, so that's the second operation that I think is important for a mapping system. And, uh, and finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about storing that resulting arrangement as a graph or a tree. So this is a problem we've been kind of focused on for a while. And, uh, and in 2019, we had a couple of papers that, that laid out basically one paper focused on this, one paper focused on this in some sense. And, um, and today I'm gonna to briefly summarize that and then talk about an alternate version. And, and what, what's special about this alternate per version is that I'm using a single grid cell module on it. Uh, I'm now going to treat the different modules, the different scales, as being like truly independent systems and a single module aids in a mapping system. So to summarize the first view, the one from our past two papers, um, in that we took advantage of grid cells as a combinatorial code. And this is something that a lot of people think about grid cells, that, that they create this sort of combinatorial uh, representation space where you can get unique locations for uh, unique representations for locations and you can represent very long distances and that was the code we used for associating with sensory input um, and then the second thing we did that I th thought was kind of clever was um, detecting these arrangements of maps so it's well known that you can use grid cell codes for uh, representing displacements uh, but, but a kind of trippy idea, it caught us off guard when we stumbled on it, is that you can also do um, displacements between maps in, in, in a way that uh, is really kind of surprising. It's sort of like a wormhole between two maps. So you detect your location on one of these maps, you detect your location on another, take the displacement between that, and, uh, and you get something that really does represent the spatial relationship of these two things. And so this this was a this is a, this is a cool idea. It's still a definite candidate, but I want to point out things that we don't like about it exactly. Uh, one is that on the on the on the top half, it doesn't really provide much opportunity for optimizations. Uh, so what I mean here is, so this really sounds send you down an avenue of a rat moving around and forming a very large number of associations of very many diff different distances, and it becomes really obvious that eventually you want something like. Um, some kind of scaling where the image on your retina is um, is not really changing as you back up. It's, it's just becoming smaller. And this type of representation does not really provide much affordance for that kind of thing. Uh, I'd rather some kind of polar coordinates for that. And the second one was, we always knew it from the start. If you use displacements for arranging maps, well, you're only using displacements. You're not 
you're not giving yourself the ability to rotate them or scale them. And grid cells, as far as I can tell, don't provide much, op much opportunity or much affordance for scaling or rotation. And so uh, I'm going to now jump into an interlude, uh, some, some inspiration from a system called RATSLAM. So this is a paper that came out in 2008, and it's a system that um, used grid cells to do something practical and mapped the suburb. And I'm not diving deep into it. There's just one thing about it I want to uh, zoom in on. And I thought it was interesting when I first saw the paper that they didn't use multiple grid cell modules. They use grid cells, but they only use a single module. Uh, and the way they pulled this off was um, they don't rely on the grid cells to do everything. It kind of complements the system. This, this experience map is it has other mapping features to it, mapping capabilities to it, and the grid cells just help the system. And to me, this was like a proof of concept that, uh, wow, a practical system that uses grid cells just in a, in a kind of a complementary way, not a central way. Uh, that to me was a nice idea and filed it away some years ago. And today I, it's basically one of the things I, main things I want to do in this talk is elevate this point of view. Uh, so that combined with some other reasons to doubt this combinatorial modules hypothesis, the idea that multiple grid cell modules create these unique location codes. Um, there are reasons to doubt this hypothesis. Uh, th for example, th the anatomy, uh, the modules are anatomically separated. The various scales of the grids, uh, th they don't occur next to each other. And it's not clear any neural population reads out from multiple modules. And second, uh, the, the paper that, that coined the term grid cell module uh, really came to the conclusion that they're truly independent. And um, that was a little bit of a controversial claim. Not everyone believes it. but. They're, they do have some evidence supporting the idea that they're truly independent, that they don't really work closely together. And so to, to lay out uh, some various models, and it's sort of in a two, two by two that I think is kind of useful, uh, these two operations I've been talking about, learning maps and arranging them, uh, we worked on through these two papers. And I put um, James's work, uh, James and Tim's work, Tom and Eichenbaum machine up here. Though theirs is really cool because it generalizes over different types of spaces. It's not just 2D space. And uh, Rastlam put on my radar that this two by two has a whole other row. And, uh, and yet though, I, what I really want to do is explore this quadrant, have a system that can arrange maps, but do it all with one module. But I think it's good to take a page out of, out of the Ratslam playbook, and that is to use a grid cell module uh, along with other parts to, uh, to solve this problem. And so what follows is a bit of a, um, it's, it's really taking an analytical look at what grid cells are good at and bad at and what I expect the rest of the system is. Or what, so, so this is, you know, the, the risk here is that it's based on just first principles thinking and not, not a lot of evidence, though I'll tie some of it to evidence. So my hunch uh, based on what I like and dislike about grid cells is that the brain uses two broad classes of location representations that complement each other. And, uh, and I mean, this isn't that imaginative. Cartesian and polar coordinates are the, are the two types that people know about. And I, I, I would argue that the brain uses a combination of both, uh, where grid cells are sort of like Cartesian coordinates without an origin. Uh, and what they kind of bring to the table is their uniform resolution, uh, which enables them to do important things like path integration, which is a word I haven't used yet in this presentation. So path integration is taking uh, your motor input, uh, taking, taking your movement info and updating your estimate of your location. And that's much easier to do if you have a uniform resolution population. Uh, but because it's uniform resolution, you have, using a fixed population of cells, you're only going to be able to cover so much distance. So it's destined to be ambiguous. Meanwhile, uh, a polar coordinate like representation can use varying resolution. Like by default, you would kind of expect it to. And that gives it the opportunity to extend over longer distances. Uh, and, and, and in my mind, this is appropriate for a lot of things like navigation vectors. And um, so, yes, what, what follows is. I'm going to speed through the next part a little bit, but, is, but by design, I think it's, I'm going to walk you through a, a system that uses a combination of these. And, uh, but it, I'm really going to kind of skim through the system. The slides are pretty detailed if anyone wants to come back and really walk through it, but I'm really just trying to give you the broad overview of it. And one thing I'll say though, and uh, before that is 
these polar coordinates have some definite candidates uh, in, in empirical data. Object vector cells are a well-known cell type at this point. And there's this whole class of these vector cells that, that seem promising to me. And so in, in the model I'm about to sketch, I use object vector cells, uh, but, but technically the cell could work with something else with uh, where you have maybe uh, separate direction and distance populations, or maybe they're combined into these, into these vector cells. And so uh, now how grid cells and these vector cells can work together. Um, and the bottom left, I'm showing grid cells, the ones that you know and love. On the bottom right, I'm showing these object vector cells, which are going to track where an animal is relative to an object. And on the top, I have another set of grid cells that track the location of the object that the, that the animal is attending to. And I'm going to walk through a set of operations that the circuit can perform. And I'm going to soon introduce a fourth population, by the way. But these three populations, uh, first of all, uh, one, the first operation that this circuit can perform, uh, sensory information arrives, and it activates an object vector cell. Uh, and so these are sort of like polar coordinates that are, that are a little bit more appropriate for that. Well, you can get further away, and things will work as, as you would want them to. You can optimize it with things like scaling. And so, so to me, uh, these are appropriate for that type of operation. Using those two populations, you can now detect the location of the object on the grid. Uh, just to quickly say it, I mean, I'm taking this vector and this bump and just saying this is where the object is now, but roughly adding this blue vector to here <laughs> to get there. Second operation. Oh, oh no, I do, I should point this out is like uh, this was an accidental realization, but um, these cells sort of resemble grid cells and primates that track vision and attention. So I could argue that, I, that in fact, all three of these are empirically observed cells. And so to con continue this sort of lightning talk on, on how all of this works, I think the second important point to talk about is how uh, a grid cell module can be used to path integrate other cell types. Given movement information, the grid cell bump of activity can move. However, this bump of activity does not move because the object's not moving. And through that, uh, th these two combined can path integrate the object vector cells. So, so even though these are coarse coded, they can still get path integrated by the system. They can still get updated when you move. Uh, third operation is uh, inferring the grid cell location from sensory input. So this, this gets back to how if an animal comes back into a room, its grid cells are re-anchored to the same way they were before. Uh, this is very much like the first operation, just switched around between these two. Uh, now, the second thing, uh, the, the second set of operations, I'm going to uh, two two total more. There are five. I've showed you three. Uh, the, the second set of, op uh, of operations involve arranging objects. So what happens now when the rat attends from the pentagon to the, to the triangle? It goes from looking at this to looking at this. What happens is those are going to activate two different object vector cells. And the displacement between those object vector cells should be represented somewhere. And so this red cell literally represents the fact that this is diagonal from that, or that this is diagonal from that. And once you've stored all of this, you can now do prediction as you attend to other objects. So here now the rat is attending from the triangle back to the pentagon. And using everything it's learned, using the course displacement uh, between objects, using the location of this object on the grid, which is fine-grained but ambiguous, you can unambiguously predict which object vector cell becomes active, which is then usable, that can then be used to predict sensory input. And one more quick slide, uh, once again, just going through this. Um, I'm making the point here that these four populations really are all necessary together. It's not enough to just have the th first three I talked about because of the ambiguity of grid cells and vector cells. Uh, because uh, any given grid cell can correspond to multiple vector cells. And uh, people can come back and think through that if uh, maybe some people got it, but this is more the, I'm giving you the, the skimmed version of this. Uh, and so to summarize though, to, to summarize this system, um, the first operation here, that of learning sensory maps uh, is, is used rather with grid cells, it's used with object vector cells or something similar. And the arrangement of those maps comes from detecting displacements between these object vector cells. Meanwhile, though, there's also a slower system where you're, you're locating each object on the grid, 
and this gets kind of updated over time. It's sort of like SLAM where you error correct it over time. But this is learned quickly. This, this is updated over time. So here I've showed a second class, a second way of doing these two techniques. And the final one, I'd, I'm probably nearing the end of my time. So the final one, I would say, is similarly a, more of a, a skimming. I'd say the, the, the main content I wanted to get across to you is this, the idea of, of a module complementing a system and polar coordinates and Cartesian coordinates working together. And uh, so, but when you, let's see, the system is learning these arrangements of maps. And the way that we think this happens is by storing them in a graph or a tree. And uh, and in a graph, I'm, I'll just give you a conceptual version of what I mean there. So what you need is some sort of a group of properties that are associated with each other, of what information and where information, and, and an association between those memories. And I'll show a neural diagram in this, for this in the next slide. A, a tree-like one is very similar. So, so here, just to make sure I said everything. Uh, associated with this pair of memories is the displacement information between them. And associated with each node is what and where information. A tree is like that, but where you have a sort of hierarchical view or where you have this parent-child relationship, which has some nice properties. And so neural mechanisms for this, I've been talking about these four populations. If you can add another population to uh, learn associations, uh, to associate them together, then uh, it's pretty straightforward to, to learn these graphs using this, this association approach. And I've roughly placed these in where they'd be medial antirrhinal cortex, lateral antirrhinal cortex, and the so-called n-gram cells and hippocampus. And nearing the end of this. Uh, so the broader view of this, so everything I've been saying right now is like kind of rigid spatial mapping. But in my mind, you can now loosen that restriction a little bit and focus on these memory graphs that are quickly learned. And, uh, and so it's kind of the more general system here would be you learn memory graphs or memory trees, associating information with each node and with each edge. And uh, this would be how I, this, this is how I would begin to attack the problem of learning these in a way that generalizes a little better rather than having them be these very rigid spatial maps. So this brings me finally to my summary. Uh, to organize this into uh, the machine learning audience and the neuroscience audience, um, some machine learning takeaways is that based on at least how we've interpreted the system, it seems that some good focus areas of for machine learning are learning apart and, arra and arranging parts into holes and anticipating input after movement, which grid cells are kind of evidence of, and anticipating input after attention shifts. And uh, second, uh, second takeaway would be you know, stepping back just what the kind of substrate, the computational substrate should look like. It seems that uh, having a set of independent modules that quickly learn graph and tree like maps is, it would be a good system. And in this system, it would associate information with nodes and displacement information with edges. And um, finally, uh, some takeaways for neuroscience. I made a point about Cartesian and polar coordinates, how grid cells can, in some sense, path integrate the other cells, but polar coordinates are, are useful for other purposes. Uh, and I made a case uh, when I, by framing this whole talk as quickly arranging maps, um, I, I'm making a case that hippocampal learning is it would be much more efficient if it learns arrangements of parts rather than a location by location memory of what is sensed. Um, that doesn't mean this is right. It just means it would be more efficient. So it's what I would expect to find in the hippocampus, but that's just based on thinking about how I'd build it, <laughs> how I'd build the hippocampus. Uh, and the, the, the final point is that it's worth considering models in which grid cell modules are truly independent. And that's the end of my talk. So I'm open to questions or discussion. Do we want to move the questions towards the end and just keep moving? Yeah, that's totally James's fair. presentation. Yeah. Sure. OK, uh, hey, well, we will go ahead and jump, up, jump over to the next one. I, I got to be the first speaker. Sorry, I'm playing with Zoom UI. Now I get to really like focus on the other talks now that mine's out of the way. <laughs> So uh, I, I will just, uh, just a couple more words of introduction of James Whittington. Um, uh, he, um, 
Sorry, I'm really fumbling with Zoom UI here. Yeah, a few a few more words about of introduction about James. I'd say one thing that um, I've learned from James's work is how to set up a neural system where everything's probabilistic. Uh, for example, if I'm modeling grid cells and I'm taking how they um, how they receive sensory input and movement input and how you, how you kind of combine those in a in a principled probabilistic way uh, it's very likely that someday i'm going to borrow james's uh, approach to that so uh, i that i appreciate having learned that uh, and so with that i'll hand the mic off to james okay unmuted um can i just double check that you are you can see the right screen is that um Yep. Yes, all okay. good. Okay, cool. Thanks for having me here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about um, uh, how do we, can we bring together space and um, relational memory uh, 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 thought together in the same, same, same brain regions. Okay, so what we're interested in is how do we store models of the world? And in particular, we're interested in models here that um, contain relationships. Um, so how do we represent the relationships between elements in the world? So uh, 50 years ago, or 50 years or so ago, um, Edward Holman was thinking about similar ideas, um, and in particular, he was thinking about the relationships of space. So he had a rodent um, placed inside of a maze, um, and at the, at the beginning, it would just explore randomly, taking this wiggly, wiggly path, um, and eventually it'd find uh, a cheese at some point in the maze. Um, and then when he uh, placed the, uh, the rodent back in the maze again at the start, the rodent thinks, oh, right, I'd quite like that cheese again. Um, but of course, uh, it has a bit of a question of how it goes about getting that cheese. So it could just go about repeating all the same actions it took. Um, of course, we know that's a bit, looks a bit silly. But if it really understood something about how the space works, you can take certain shortcuts. I mean, it doesn't need to do all the wiggles back on itself. It could just go straight to the cheese. But to do that, it really needs to understand um, what is space, the relationships of space. Um, okay, so while um, uh, Tolman sort of uh, uh, put rats in there and showed that they really did take these shortcuts um, and uh, that um, uh, uh, made him believe that these rodents actually had an internal model, internal map of the relationships of the, uh, of the world, he didn't really know what the neural bases were behind um, uh, uh, what you know, going on in the rat's brain. Um, so as has just been elucidated, there's lots of different cells that we found over the last, um, uh, uh, last few decades such as these enterhinal grid cells that we've just spoken about, um, or hippocampal play cells, which um, only fire in one location, not like the lots of locations um, are like grid cells. Um, there's also uh, things like object vector cells that we saw that always fire at the same distance and direction away from objects, or border cells that always fire at borders in, in enterhinal cortex. And again, in hippocampus, that's the, the, the green bit of the brain there, um, you also get these landmark cells, which fire at um, distance and, and, and certain orientations away from objects, but not for every object. Okay, so while, um, uh, uh, well, a little bit after um, uh, all the sort of cognitive maps and um, rodents and cheese ma and mazes were going on, um, the hippocampus was also implicated very deeply in this notion of what called, called relational memory. So if I told you, for example, that uh, Jane is stronger than Bob and Bob is stronger than Alice, and Alice is stronger than Gina and so on, and then if I came, across and came along and asked you who's stronger, Bob or Gina, you would be able to tell me that Bob was. That's because you're able to chain together these little bits of information that I've given you already. And indeed, um, rats are also able to um, chain, to chain together those pairs of, pairs of observations, even if they're only ever shown A is better than B or C is better than D in um, one case, they can chain it together and make these inferences. It turns out if you lesion if you, um, 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 these parts of the brain, like hipp the hippocampus, these rats can still answer these single pair-like questions like, oh, I prefer B over C, but they cannot correctly answer, I prefer B over D. They can't chain together and make these inferences, these transitive inferences. Um, and again, similarly, uh, uh, similar stories found in uh, pro problems of social hierarchies. Um, the sort of same brain regions are, are, are deeply implicated there too. Um, and uh, again, we just, um, again, I'm sort of repeating, but I'll run through it quickly. Um, those play cells that we saw in space only fired in one location of space also seem to um, fire in only one location of sound frequency. If I ask a, a, a rodent to hold a lever until a certain sound comes on, a certain sound frequency appears, that's very, very non-spatial, no spatial um, component to it whatsoever. Yet these hippocampal cells seem to be like play cells, but on sound frequencies. And similarly, you also find these um, uh, multi-peak cells, which would be a little bit like a slice, a linear, you know, 1D slice or a grid cell. Um, and again, also that was spoke, spoken about, um, 
if you get participants to 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 uh, watch a bird on the screen where its neck stretches or its leg stretches, um, but importantly those stretches are like taking walking through some two D bird space. Um, patient participants uh, uh, have these sort of hexadirectional, um, you know, classic signals uh, characteristic of grid cells found in entorhinal cortex. So this is all a bit strange. We've got this one system um, that seems to be implicated in both spatial and non-spatial problems. It's all, it's all seems to be about relational inferences and, and, and what's going on there. Um, uh, and so we're going to try and answer these questions and, and, and also try and answer what, why on earth do these uh, uh, cells look, look the way they do. Um, and so we're going to start doing this by um, really trying to think about what is the actual structure of the problem the brain is trying to solve in, in these particular cases. Okay, so we're going to try and elucidate that now. Um, okay, so if I come along and told you, tell you that Bob is Janice's brother and Alice is Janice's child, I've given you two bits of information, but you actually know an awful lot more than that. You also know that Bob is Alice's uncle and Alice is Bob's niece and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know that because you know what a family tree is. You know that all of these sort of relationships like parent plus brother, you know that's the same as an uncle. It's sort of a little bit like path integration that, that Marcus um, spoke about, where you sort of add up movement vectors, but now we're sort of adding up these funky family tree vectors. So sort of path integration for an arbitrary space. So that's not all um, that we're interested in. So once you, um, uh, uh, you know, we're interested in more than just one family, but the, the important thing is once you know what a family tree is, once you know what brother and sister and uncle and niece and parent and child are, you can take that knowledge and, oh, and you can apply it to a, uh, another family. So when I come across Jean and Tim and Elsie, I automatically know about all the, you know, the relationships between them. I, I, I have a sort of framework for understanding this new family in. I can generalize this knowledge to a new situation. Um, and so that's true for family trees, um, but it's also exactly the same for space. Space is just a, a bunch of relationships, a two dimensional uh, sets of relationships between, between elements of the world. Okay. So this brings me to um, uh, the Tolman, uh, Tolman Eichenbaum machine. Uh, and that's gonna be a model for learning and generalizing these sorts of relational knowledge. And um, it's gonna try and be a, bit of a model for, for, um, uh, for these cellular representations as well. Okay, so if I come along and um, give you this problem, I'm gonna say, right, I'm gonna show you a, a light bulb, a, a right, a broom, a down, a motorbike, a right, and so on. And at the end of it, I'm gonna say, you get to a banana and go up, what do you see next? Now that sounds like a bit of a tricky problem, but it's made an awful lot easier if you've um, um, if those stimuli uh, are drawn from uh, you know real two D graph worlds and you've seen lots of these stimuli before um, to be able to understand what two D is. So if you're able to understand what two D is, you can abstract. You can have that abstract notion of um, you know north plus east plus south plus west means you're back in the same place. And so if you have that knowledge, I can then show you this same sequence which looks a bit of a puzzle. But now you can really, ah, I, you know, I know what the sequence is. I just place it on this, um, on this backbone, this sort of relational backbone. And so now when I, I'm at the banana and you, you, uh, uh, you tell me go up, you know it's a light bulb because you've, um, and you understand uh, what the notion of space is. And you can just you know, put, that, put that new sequence in the context of the spatial knowledge that you already have. Okay, um, I've got that. Ah, you can answer what the light bulb is. Okay, and again, exactly the same thing's true for family trees. Um, okay, so this sort of boils this problem down of how do I predict things in the world? How do I predict sensory observations in the world? And it boils it down to um, two really key components. First one is, can I sort of um, represent location in some abstract space, in some abstract structure? So that was gonna be, where am I in the family or where am I in this spatial graph or where am I in this chain of transitive inferences? Oh, I've got a... Um, and, uh, uh, and the other component is going to be, right, now I've got this abstract thing, how can I link this abstract um, space to the real world? And so here, for example, we've got the, the, the lovely family of Tim, and you know, the, each, each character there takes, um, uh, takes a particular location in this family graph. Tim's a father, Louise's wife, uh, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's really two things. Can I represent this abstract structure? And can I have memories so I can bind together specific instances to places in this, um, in this family tree. And the, and the important thing about having a memory is that I can reuse a different memory for different families. So I can have the same fam abstract structure of I mean, same abstract notion of family, but I can reuse it for one family at one time and a different family at another time. Okay, so how are we gonna go um, about doing this? 
so let's start with the memory because that's um, the, the easier bit. Right, so um, people think about uh, memories in the brain as uh, these you know, sort of Hebbian networks. Uh, okay, so what they do is they take a sensory representation, here's a sensory representation of a, a motorbike, and they put it into a memory network. And this is gonna be a bit like a Hopfield network if, if, if anyone's um, familiar with that. Uh, okay, and the point is when you put that in, you can sort of upweight coactive neurons um, using Hebbian learning, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, and that's kind of fun because the next time um, you come along, you can store that in the weights. Next time you come along and I just show you a partial bit of this memory, a little bit of a motorbike, um, that alone, that partial uh, sensory representation is enough to um, sort of be inputted into the network. And then I can retrieve the full memory just from that partial memory. And I can retrieve um, uh, you know, the fact that I saw there's a full uh, motorbike um, uh, uh, there. So it's an ability to uh, store memories and retrieve them from partial inputs. Okay. That's not quite what we want, unfortunately. What we're really interested in is, um, uh, is relational memories. That's uh, memories of observations that know where they are in an abstract structure. We're not just interested in memories or observations alone. We want to know where they are in some abstract space. We want to know that this motorbike is at position B. Um, OK, so how can we go about doing that? Well, let's just take, for, um, for example, that we, um, so that's what we want, we want the motorbike at B. Let's take, for example, that we, um, uh, we know how to represent this motorbike with this little red, red uh, bunch of neurons down there. Um, well, so we do know how to do that. And let's take, uh, let's imagine for a case that we understand how to represent where we are in this abstract space, where, how we're at B somehow. We're just going to represent, represent that with that, these blue neurons here. Um, and as I said, the thing that we're really interested in is knowing that the motorbike is at B. And we're going to do that by sort of smushing together these two bits of information. A bit of, we're going to put into our memory network both knowledge about the motorbike and knowledge about where we are. That's going to be um, form a conjunctive memory now. And so the cells are going to fire in this memory network. We're going to fire if, um, only if they get both inputs um, um, from the structural knowledge, abstract structural knowledge, and the sensory knowledge. And then again, we can just do this auto-associative heavy and learning to um, uh, between upweight weights between coactive neurons. Okay, so this is rather good because this allows us to play a bit of a trick. I can then come along um, and provide a partial bit of input of this memory. But now the, the trick is that the partial bit is just only the, 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 the abstract where information. I can input that into this memory network and then retrieve um, the sensory knowledge. So just like I put a partial motorbike in before and retrieved the full motorbike, now I can put the partial where information and retrieve the full what and where information. Or exactly the same, but in the other direction, I can put in just a motorbike and I can retrieve the where information. That's sort of rather nice. And this is, this is what's gonna allow us to, um, um, to make all these sensory predictions that I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Okay, so how um, that's, you know, memory sorted, but I mean, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll consolidate that knowledge in a second. But the question is like, we made a bit of an assumption that we had this blue representation already. So what we're gonna try and wonder about now is how do we get to that blue representation in the first place? Okay, so we're gonna do this by training um, a, a neural network and let's, let's see what we can do in training. Okay, again, so let's believe that we um, have some sort of representation of, of where this red X is. Um, and that's going to be in this blue blue um, representation here. And then I'm going to come along and say, go to your uncle. Um, and then uh, it's going to transform this representation um, just by some linear mapping or just some sort of mapping to a new representation, just a set of weights there. Um, and uh, these are going to really be the important weights, the weights that we're interested in, because those weights of how I move around the space are really the weights that define what the space is, define the family tree or define the 2D space, whatever it is. Okay. Then once we transition to this new representation, I can then retrieve the memory of that memory network. Um, uh, uh, you know, just because I've got the where information, I can ret retrieve the full memory of what I think is at C. And in this case, I predicted it's going to be a chair. Ah, and so that's wonderful. When I open my eyes and see it, uh, see it is a chair. It's brilliant. I, I predicted that correctly. But if I was wrong, if I wasn't right, um, then that's an error. That's an error I can use to do error back propagation. And sort of um, rejig all these all these weights at the top um, to, to you know predict better next time. Next time I, I, I would have been at that location or an analogous location. And so over time and over these errors, um, this overall network is going to hopefully learn what is the abstract space that I'm in and how to um, you know address memories properly. Okay, 
So that's a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of high level technical-ish mumbo jumbo. But the real question is, 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 is does, it actually, does it actually work? Okay, so um, if it did work, I would show it this whole sequence um, of sensory stimuli and it should be able to predict what's coming next. And in particular, let's say, for example, that this sequence of sensory stimuli came, oh, crumbs, came from um, this uh, sort of torturous red trajectory on this hexagonal world. Um, then by at the end of the hexag at the end of this um, this trajectory, I've only ever I've only visited all the nodes of this graph. I actually haven't visited an awful lot of the edges, but once I visited all the nodes, it should really know everything about that graph because it already hopefully has this old structural knowledge that it can reuse. The old has the old knowledge of how everything relates to each other in, a, in an abstract way. But now I've seen all the particularities, um, and so it should um, it should get perfect prediction after it's seen all of these nodes. And that's exactly what we see. Um, so the you know, performance is in line with the number of nodes I've seen, not the number of edges that I've seen. Okay, and um, uh, we can do the same sort of stuff in these worlds of transitive inference. I should say all the worlds are actually much bigger than what I'm showing here. Um, and so the blue line is right at the very beginning of training. It's, it's got no idea what's going on. But after it's seen 10, 20, 30 of these sort of I, I, um, 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 transitive in inference graphs, it's sort of been able to abstract the structure of what's going on. And immediately, straight away, it performs really well in new worlds. And that's um, exactly the same in these um, family tree-like structures as well. At the first, in, in the blue bit, it's rubbish. But after the top in the gold, immediately it only needs to see something once and then it's understood then it knows um, what's going on okay so it can perform these relational inferences and it can perform those transitive inferences um like I, like what like what i showed you that rodents were um rodents and humans can do okay so it works but what about um how this network is actually representing the world okay so I'm going to first just um, take this model, TEM, and I'm going to let it diffuse about randomly in, in, in space. So it's just going to wander around from node to node, um, uh, trying to predict what's coming up next. Um, and so if we have a look and peek inside these neurons in this abstract, that blue layer, we can see that we see things that look a lot like grid cells. And there are grid cells of different frequencies. They're grid cells of different phases, like Marcus was talking, things that are shifted from one another. And you also get um, things that look like band cells too. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's rather interesting. Um, oh, that shouldn't be there. Um, and then if I also look inside the hippocampus, this sort of memory bit of, of the Tom Lycan -like machine, I also can see uh, place cells. So cells are just fire in one location. I can see little ones and I can see big ones. And again, that's just like um, uh, uh, what you see in, in the brain, in the rodent um, hippocampus. Okay, so that was just um, diffusing around, uh, you know, willy nilly pretty randomly. But what, what if I get it to behave a little bit like a rat? Well, rats like running near walls. They like approaching um, special shiny objects. But the interesting thing is, once you start behaving a bit differently, it changes your likely transition probabilities. And because TEM, although it's building this map, it's a transition map. And so once you change the likely transitions, you're going to change the optimal representations to be learned. OK, so what do you see? Uh, you see these things that look like object vector cells. That's cells that fire at certain angles and orientations away from objects. And so you get the fire, this one fires always five pixels to the north of an object, this one always five pixels to the, to the east of an object. And again, these cells generalize across worlds. And, and that's exactly like um, uh, real object vector cells. And similarly, exactly the same picture is seen for borders, a border that cares about the left border in one world, cares about the left border in the other world. Okay, so what's this sort of saying? It's sort of saying this whole spectrum of cells that we saw, maybe grid cells, object vector cells, border cells, well, they, they all look like their own different beasts. They all actually just seem to be representing transitions and using those transitions um, to optimize the inferences in new worlds, to generalize really. Okay, and then again, if we peek inside hippocampus, this is our memory bit, um, uh, we see these um, landmark cells, these cells that fire at certain distances, distances and orientations away from objects. But crucially, they do not do it for every object in the environment, only a subset of the objects in the environment. And again, that's exactly like um, landmark cell, real landmark cells in, in, in rodent hippocampus. Um, um, and again, compare that with the entrinal cells, which, which um, fire for every object. We've got these ones on the right that really generalize across everything, and the ones on the left that are specific to the particular world that we're looking at. Okay, so that's rather fun. Um, but let's um, uh, try to think a little bit deeper about how does this structure really generalize across environments. 
Um, okay, so uh, that's not the, the best picture, right, I'm afraid. So it is really the case that a grid cell in one environment is a grid cell in the other environment. So just as Marcus was saying, it's, it's, you can reuse that knowledge in one environment um, and put it in, an, in another. Um, and that's true for entorhinal cortex, uh, uh, but um, what, uh, what's going on in hippocampus? So when in hippocampus, it's um, thought to believe that cells which um, map one world are completely randomly reshuffled to, to, to code for a map or place cells so, so that, that code for one point in an environment that totally codes for a totally different place in a, in a new environment. And, and a little bit more precisely, it's saying that two cells that might fire next to each other in one environment do not necessarily fire next to each other in another environment. And that is not the same as grid cells. Two cells that fire each other for grid cells fire each other uh, next to each other in the other environments. Okay. Um, but uh, what do we see inside this model? We see exactly that. And here's a, a little cell, a little place cell that fires in one place and it fires in a new place, or a big place cell which fires in one place and fires in a new place. Okay, Look, that, we've got that in term, and that seems to also, um, that, well, it is also true in, 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 in rodent hippocampus. Okay, looks pretty random, but the question is, is it really? So if we remember, oh, sorry, I'm going a bit faster than I was expecting. So if we remember that um, uh, these hippocampal memory cells to, to really do this memory properly, we have to make it conjunctive. We have to have um, cells that uh, combine both abstract, where am I in the space, with what am I seeing right now? These, each cell knows a bit about where am I and what am I seeing? And that's rather interesting because if I go to new worlds, um, uh, the sensory things might all be totally different. You know, um, um, my house is probably very different to your house, but the structure of the space is probably pretty similar. You know, corridor and your door, you know, rooms still come off the end of corridors and, you know, there's no wormholes or teleports or anything like that. Space is still the same. So what that says is um, hippocampal cells, although they're going to remap, although they will change place, there's something that should still be preserved. The structure, the structural elements of these cells should still be preserved. Okay, a little bit more precisely over what that might look like. So although a place cell, here's a place cell, will remap between two different um, worlds, when it remaps, it will be it will um, maintain its uh, relationship to the structure-preserving grid cells. So, so here's a um, here's a, a a place cell that fires at the same location as a, of, of one of these grid cell fires. So when it remaps, although it remaps to a new location, that location will also be at a grid peak. Okay, so you can remap to different locations, but because grid cells are many peaks, uh, um, uh, they, you know it will remap to one of the locations. Of, of one of those grid peaks. Okay, so the, what that really says is that if I um, uh, take a grid cell firing um, at the peak of, uh, uh, of place cell firing in one environment, and I um, correlate it with the grid cell firing at the peak of a, uh, other place cells in, in another environment, I should see a, um, a correlation. Okay, and so we do exactly this uh, in simultaneously recorded place in grid cells in, in, in rodents. Um, and we see a correlation and it survives the pretty stringent um, uh, uh, um, statistical analysis. And we, we see that in both when rodents navigate real environments, that's the top, and when rodents navigate virtual environments. So that's, you know, in this case, the rodents actually just on a ball moving, it's not actually moving anywhere in space, but um, you know, it's seeing a visual field move as if it was moving in space. Okay, so that's rather exciting. This is a sort of novel result of, um, of hippocampal remapping that isn't actually random. Okay, so we thought a lot about space. Um, can we think a little bit about um, slightly more complicated tasks? Okay, so um, there's a very beautiful experiment done um, where rodents would run around um, a, a, a uh, uh, run in a loop around a little environment like this. And it, interestingly about this experiment, it wasn't just that it was running in a loop, it was the fact that after it completed four loops, so one, two, three, four, four laps, um, it would then be get, get given a reward. And so it would do lap, 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 reward, lap, 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 reward, lap, 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 reward, and so on. Um, and so that's quite interesting because now there's two structures at play here. There's both the structure of the, of the um, sensory world, of the spatial world, i.e. I'm on a loop. And then there's also the structure of the task, i.e. I have to do four things in a row, four laps in a row, and to get reward. I've got a simultaneous thing going on. Okay, so what would Tem say in this case? Well, Tem would say, right, if you want to be predicting your immediate sensory experience, you better have um, cells which care about space. Because you know, when, I, when I do a loop of space, um, I, sh I should be able to predict um, something that I, that I saw you know, just a few steps before. However, 
I also need some sort of representation which knows about four lapness because I want to be able to predict when am I getting that reward after after four laps. Okay, so I'll get these. Um, you know, on, on the left, I'll get cells which carry, you know fire in the same place um, every lap, but then I'll also get cells which fire for specific laps. That's what Tem says. Um, okay. And um, uh, 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 Chen Sun did this wonderful experiment, certainly before we had thought of, thought of it. Uh, you know, we only thought of it because he had already thought of it. Um, uh, uh, and he saw exactly this. He saw in hippocampus, sorry. He saw um, play cells which uh, fire both um, just like normal play cells, i.e. for the same place on every lap, uh, you see at the top. But then you also see play cells, you see a lap one cell, you see a lap two cell, you also see these cells sort of ramping activity as if they're counting. And all of these sort of the same, all of these same sorts of cells are all observed in TEM. So you get this simultaneous representation of um, sensory input and task position. Um, okay, so that's rather that's rather fun as well. Um, and last uh, 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 bit that I've got here is that you know earlier we saw um, we saw this remapping in space, and we saw that TEM was saying that oh, hippocampal cells. Um, you know, uh, uh, the structure is preserved so in interanual um, um, cells when, when, they, when, they, um, when they, they, they move. And that means that place cells should also inherit a bit of that structural preservation. Um, but this is a bit of a more of a funky task because now if we get a rodent to run in, in, in one of one box like this, do four laps in one box, in one lap, and then move it into a new box, you know, it still has to do the four laps, but it's, it is a new box. Um, uh, what Tem says is right, the cells which care about space should remap because space, you know, the spatial orient the spatial orientation of the sensory stuff is different. The hippocampal cells which care about a bit of sensory stuff um, will, will, and space will change because the sensory things changed. Um, but what it says is uh, because um, it's still doing a four lap environment, if a, even if a cell remaps spatially, it will still care about the same lap. That is very important. Even though it remaps spatially, if it cares about a lap, it'll care about the same lap in both cases. Um, and that's what Tem says here. Uh, and, um, and that's exactly what um, Chen Sun found in, in his data as well. OK, so in, in summary, I, I, I tried to convince you that relational reasoning and space are, are really two sides of the, uh, of the same, same coin. And the same uh, sort of fundamental mechanisms of, 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 of principles of generalization can apply to both. Um, uh, I've tried to say that. Uh, relational um, structure is, uh, is abstracted and represented explicitly in, in, in the brain, where enterinal cells are, are just a basis for representing transitions. Hippocampal cells are, are, are representations for uh, making memories of what is where, um, and, and that means that this phenomena such as hippocampal remapping is not in fact random. Um, instead, uh, instead, there's um, some structural knowledge pres preserved. Um, and so that I want to uh, uh, thank, uh, uh, in particular, Tim, who's um, on the call and will hopefully uh, answer questions very well later. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for such a great presentation. And I think the next person we have is Tim. Cool, yeah, I'll, I'll say a few more words uh, of introduction as, as uh, Kim gets set up. So yeah, James, stop sharing. So uh, yeah, so I, one thing I have learned from Kim and from Kim's work is uh, she really put eigenvectors on my radar. Uh, previously, they were a thing I sort of learned about in school and now they're a thing that I, I'll be out hiking and suddenly I'm thinking about eigenvectors. So thank you, Kim, for that. <laughs> Thanks, I'm, I'm delighted for that to be part of my legacy. Um, that's high praise. Okay. Um, so. My name is Kim Stackenfeld. Um, as mentioned, I'm a research scientist at DeepMind on the neuroscience team. Um, I wanna thank uh, Marcus and Charmaine for inviting me. Um, this is really fun. I've heard uh, James's talk about grid cells a couple times, but it's always a delight, especially because you present with such like vigor and energy um, and because the model's super cool. Um, I'm gonna talk about some uh, related work that involves structure learning, um, the hippocampus, um, and some ideas in machine learning about representation learning. Um, so to start off, I'll, I'll visit this question or revisit this question um, that I think we've all thought about in different ways, um, which is what do we want out of a representation, um, particularly when we're talking about a region such as hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, um, where grid cells are, um, what would the properties of a good representation for scaffolding the acquisition of new information look like? 
Um, and it's a bit of a cliche for people who study hippocampus to be into maps, um, but I, I have one, so so be it. Um, this is uh, an old drawing of a map I really like, and I like it because it's nicely illustrative of many of the challenges of representation, uh, many of the things that we've talked about and we'll talk about more. Um, so you have a number of different types of experiences bundled up into this map. Um, this map can support many different types of tasks, whether it would be visual recognizability, navigational information, uh, information indicating the different functions of different buildings like farms and churches. Um, you also have this hodgepodge of different coordinate systems um, and different coordinate systems and the importance of this is something Marcus alluded to. Um, you have egocentric and allocentric views in particular all like forced into this, this 2D drawing. Um, and you also have this property where certain things are represented with a high degree of detail, um, probably when that detail is relevant, um, and other details are neglected or, or entirely absent. Um, for instance, I'd be pretty confident using this map to identify the church in the town square. I wouldn't be that confident using it to navigate back country because that's almost entirely blank. Only roads are really depicted. Um, so I think it strikes this, this familiar trade-off between richness and simplicity. Um, and it's a, it's a nice illustration of some of these principles. It's also kind of fun because it's artsy. Um, and this map, um, I think it's obvious that it was made by humans, um, but we also know that animals seem to learn and represent structure too. Um, and as you've heard about uh, quite a bit already, we think that place cells and grid cells are a big part of this. Um, we think of these in, in map-like terms as well. Um, so one kind of conventional view of how we think about place cells and grid cells is that place cells are representing location with some degree of specificity, um, some, some degree of like, this is something you can bind to that will keep information specific to this one episode or experience that you're encountering. Um, whereas we think maybe grid cells are representing this more generalizable metric information. Um, and of course, this is something uh, that James talked about too in a really good degree of detail um, that, you know, the, the grid cells are representing what's this self-similarity that space has that lets you take some knowledge about one part of space and apply it to all other uh, environments that have that structure as well. And of course, we know that hippocampus, while a lot of the, the cells seem to have spatial receptivity, um, and while there's a ton of research on how physical space is represented in a lot of detail by hippocampus, seems like it's not just for physical space. Um, you already heard about these tasks um, and these environments where hippocampus and entorhinal cortex represent these really highly non-spatial variables, like the dimensions of a bird is a pretty pretty wacky one um, from Alexa's now, now famous experiment with Tim, um, and as well as these pitch cells that you can find in rodent hippocampus that represent sound when that's the task relevant variable. Um, and it gets even, even a little more wacky when we realize that these cells are not just for physical space and they're not just for things that have this underlying Euclidean structure that have the same kind of geometric properties of space, even though they're not physically spatial environments, but they're also for things that are not even quite structured like space. Um, so these are some examples of environments that are better represented as discrete task spaces or Markov decision processes, where you have a bunch of discrete states that you can transition among, but they're not arranged in this Euclidean planar or linear way. Um, like these tasks are with the, with the birds and with the pitch. Um, and so um, these tasks, um, all, in, in all of these tasks, we see hippocampal activity that's consistent with representing your location, but not necessarily in a task that has the same kind of planar structure. Um, and I should mention that, that this paper, the, the Garvard et al. paper from 2017 is also from Tim's lab. So if you wanna ask about it in the panel, he'll be there. Um, this, um, yeah, so I think the thing about this, this these two ways of thinking about things um, is that it brings us to this normative question of what should these representations be for? Um, and I think one of the compelling things about the spatial view is that spatial representations have this powerful generalizability. Um, if you have a representation of spatial structures, you can use this every time you're in a spatial structure, there's a lot of self-similarity to space. Why would you wanna relearn that every time? Um, these, these more graph-like tasks, these more uh, discrete task spaces, are in a way a lot more expressive and flexible. Um, you can learn many more types of, of relational spaces. You can learn more ways that things relate to each other, um, but there, but you that's, you perhaps lose some of the generalizability. It's not that you have this self-similarity anymore. You now have this flexibility where you can form any kinds of relations to each other. Um, and this kind of view is more consistent with the idea that hippocampus is representing relations between states 
um, this Eichenbaum-Cohen Cohen view that James talked about, or maybe that hippocampus is learning a transition model between states, um, and it can iterate over this in order to produce reasoning. Um, so one of the things that we're interested in doing is trying to reconcile these views a bit, get the, the good parts of geometry, this generalizability and reusability, um, as well as the, the flexibility and expressiveness that, um, that, that graphs give us. Um, and this is a topic that James also talked about a lot. Um, a lot of the ideas we've talked about have a lot of overlap, um, which isn't a coincidence. I've just been like really influenced by them and talked to Tim and James a lot. Um, the view that we're gonna take for this perspective um, is a reinforcement learning view. Um, basically, we're going to anchor our, our desiderata of what we want in a representation um, with the reinforcement learning framework. We're gonna say, what's a good um, representation to support efficient reinforcement learning? Um, and the reinforcement learning problem is this one. Given some task, you wanna learn a policy to maximize your expected cumulative reward or value over future states by trial and error. Um, the reason we're using the reinforcement learning framework here is it's super general and kind of minimally specified. You can apply it to lots of different types of problems. Um, you can apply it to things like chess, where your state is the configuration of pieces on the board, and you want to maximize your probability of winning. You could apply it to something really open-ended like cooking, where your state is whether you're chopping vegetables or chopping bread, and you want to, or if you're stirring or, um, or chopping, and you want to maximize your probability of eating a delicious meal as soon as possible. Um, and then you can apply it, of course, to this familiar example of navigation, uh, where if you're this rat, you want to maximize the number of delicious morsels you encounter while navigating this very complicated maze. The problem with reinforcement learning, the challenge we face, is that this can be very hard and actually complicated real world type problems like cooking, um, even, even things like navigation. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that reinforcement learning throws away a lot of information. If you're only learning about reward and you only get Fruit Loops every once in a while, then you've thrown away a lot of the information about the environment that wasn't directly linked with reward. Um, information has to prove its value by a very high threshold if you're using reinforcement learning. Um, and then the other thing that's a challenge in all types of learning is that there's just a lot of states that you want to learn about. It can be hard to explore them efficiently, and you're learning in a very high dimensional space. So you have this, this curse of dimensionality where you need a lot of data to represent this space fully, unless you're going to try like assume some structure or learn some structure about the space that can help you um, round away these errors. Um, so the question from this perspective um, is it's a reframing, I think, of, of a similar perspective, which is just how does the brain learn and represent structure in order to support a efficient and flexible learning, in particular reinforcement learning? Um, so what do we need in an RL representation? Um, this question has been asked a lot in machine learning. Um, and we can break this down into the two challenges I described for reinforcement learning. The first being that if you're only learning about reward, you're throwing away a lot of information. So what additional structure should we be learning? The second is how can we make this information generalize? Um, and this maps onto this, this view of the, the expressive graph structures and the generalizable spatial representations that, that I tried to um, invoke earlier on. So one answer to what structure should we learn is predictions about what comes next. Um, and this basically means that your, your representation of state should incorporate information about what's going to happen next, that that's the most likely to be relevant um, in terms of capturing information that you wanna anchor your learning process to. Um, so the, the basic logic of this is that if you don't know what you're trying to do in advance, if you don't know what's gonna be rewarding and what's not, um, then all you know is that you're trying to make some prediction about some feature that will turn out to be rewarding. Um, and if you're just trying to predict everything, whatever's rewarding will turn up as a special case. So this is just like a safe way to anchor the learning process um, according to the, the, the logic of predictive representations. Um, this has been the focus of a lot of work. Um, I think uh, my list stops at 2018, but it shouldn't. Uh, there's been a lot of um, really nice work in, in machine learning on um, using predictive representations um, as, as a representation to support reinforcement learning and learning in general. This other question of how we can make it generalized um, can be answered with this idea of compression, that you want to learn as short a description as possible. Uh, and the, the logic of this is that if you're learning short descriptions, it forces overlap between different things that are described with a similar code, because you've, you've limited your, your description space. Um, and if you 
have overlap between different states that predict similar things, then when you learn about one of those states, you'll automatically learn about all of the other states with overlapping representations. Um, so this is kind of the logic of why compression is an important part of forming a representation that's useful for reinforcement learning. Instead of listing individual works here, I, uh, I really just listed like areas of machine learning that take a different perspective on compression. It's like a very ubiquitous and, and widely um, applied concept. Um, so there's, there's just a lot of stuff in that space. Um, so we had this paper out a while ago where we were mapping these representation learning ideas onto, um, onto neural correlates um, in the hippocampus and entorhinocortex. Um, so we, we said that you can explain place cell activity in terms of a representation of how often you will visit other states, that it's trying to predict what other states you're going to visit in a short amount of time, and that grid cells are capturing the low dimensional structure among these predictions. They're trying to summarize this predictive information as succinctly as possible. And I should say that one of the reasons that, that we that we kind of define things in these really broad ways, that we talk about things in terms of prediction and compression rather than immediately going to a specific algorithm, is that this means that we're talking about our representations in terms of objectives we should have for them. And this is really easy to apply to deep learning. Um, if I, I'm gonna talk about using linear algebra to learn predictive representations and to compress them, um, However, you could set the same thing up with a neural network where you're trying to learn a deep embedding of a predictive representation or a deep representation that compresses something like a VAE. Um, so this, this neurofiability is one of the things that makes this representation learning perspective very uh, compelling in machine learning. But for now, we're gonna go through a much simpler manifestation of these ideas using linear algebra. Um, so we're gonna start with a predictive representation called a successor representation. Um, the rows of this matrix are possible starting states you could have, the columns are possible states you could visit, and every entry in this matrix captures the expected number of times you're gonna visit some state J given a starting state I. So basically this matrix captures, captures how often you're going to visit every state. Uh, and we're gonna assume a discretized linear environment that our rat is wandering around. Um, it's just a linear track and it's taking a random walk so there's no directional biases or anything interesting like that. Um, so we can compress this matrix using eigen decomposition, um, or more generally singular value decomposition, um, and that involves rewriting this matrix in terms of the product of three matrices. The first is a matrix of eigenvectors of this matrix, um, which is why Marcus now thinks of them on his long hikes. The second matrix is the matrix of eigenvalues uh, that are, it's a diagonal matrix that weights each of these eigenvectors by some amount. Um, and the last matrix is the matrix of eigenvectors transposed. It's just the same as the first, but flipped on its side. And we, if, if we have 10 states in our starting environments, we'll have 10 eigenvectors. However, if we truncate these eigenvectors, um, removing the ones that have the smallest eigenvalue, um, then we can reconstruct this matrix, but with a lower resolution. Um, so this is a low rank reconstruction because we only kept six of the eigenvectors. You can see it kind of looks like the matrix above it, but it doesn't have quite as much sharpness along the diagonal. It's smoothed, it's coarser. If we keep fewer and fewer eigenvectors, then we get a coarser and coarser representation. Um, so we represent this here as just truncating and only keeping six or four or three or two eigenvectors. But you can also think of this as weighting these eigenvectors uh, so that you're downweighting the high frequency components, these, these eigenvectors that have very small eigenvalues, um, and upweighting the, the low frequency coarser ones. Um, and this view of like weighting and filtering them will come up later. Um, so these eigenvectors were a model of how um, grid cells could be generated that, that we proposed in this 2017 paper. Um, we use this to simulate uh, some of the ways in which eigenvectors change in irregularly geometric environments. Um, so in environments where you don't necessarily have a square, but you have a trapezoid or a hexagon or circles, you see different shapes of grid cells and we could capture some aspects of this. Um, same thing with how grid cells fragment in a hairpin maze or how they change in multi-compartment environments. Um, so the, the basic takeaway, like the, the official headline from this work is that we captured many of the aspects of how interruptions to the transition structure of space are known to affect grid cells. Um, and one of the things that we were particularly excited about and anchored to with this model is that we wanted to have relationally specified models so that we could make hypotheses for non-Euclidean geometries, um, geometries like these graph environments that I showed early on. Uh, I also should say that the, this work is related to 
a bunch of other approaches in the grid cell world. Um, these, what, what many of these works have in common is that they all anchor grid cells to the transition statistics of space. They show that these, these grid-like patterns can emerge from a particular statistical view of space and don't necessarily require some like innate uh, encoding of, of navigation. Um, you'll see James models is in there. Um, I also bolded this model from Sorcher et al. Because I think one of the things that's nice about that model is they specifically explore how you can constrain this optimization process in order to generate cells that are more biologically grid-like. Um, there's a bunch of ways in which these eigenvectors um, are like differ from what you actually see in grid cells. Um, Namely, like they're a little more checkerboard than they are hexagonal. Um, and, and this work by Sorcher et al. explains like the different constraints you can use to, to determine whether or not that's the case. Um, Dordic et al. also covered that um, in some early work. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned was nice about, about compression um, is that it can capture the structure of your environment and um, in, a, in a succinct way. Um, so this manifests differently in different types of environments. Um, if we look at the top left, um, you can see that in environments with clusters, um, the first um, the first few eigenvectors here is just shown the first um, non-trivial eigenvector will partition your your graph environment into different clusters. Um, and this is used in spectral clustering techniques um, in if you've um, learned about some of those um, in your machine learning courses. Um, another thing that you can do with these is capture low dimensional representations um, when, when that's applicable. Um, you can think of clusters as a particular type of low dimensional representation in environments that are more planar, um, like this um, random planar graph, then the first two eigenvectors will span the dimensions of the space and sort of flatten it out and expose the low dimensional structure. Um, and another cool thing about them is that if you have an environment with self similarities, um, if you have uh, an environment that can be rotated onto itself, um, then you'll get multiple eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue, um, and that will help you organize your environment and kind of like fold it up in a way that minimizes redundancies. Um, so whatever your, your environment and its particular structure, whether it's planar or not, um, you can use these types of representations and, and other things that, that do compression as well to try and capture the geometry in a specific way. Another important aspect of these representations um, is that you can organize information according to the spatial scale. Um, so the first few eigenvectors will change very slowly across your environment. Um, if we look at the top row, then we basically reconstruct the, the Fourier basis for a line. We have sinusoids that change at different frequencies. Um, if this were a circular environment, we'd have sines and cosines. For this linear one, we have only cosines. For 2D planar environments, we get essentially the analogous thing. We get 2D Fourier components um, that vary both along the X and the Y axis. But if we start to look in these environments that don't have Euclidean geometry anymore, that aren't linear or planar, then we see that you also get this range of scales, but it's adjusted for the particular graph structure that you have. Um, so you kind of get like different peaks and troughs in this triangular environment. Um, but the peaks and troughs are forced onto the structure of the graph. It's sort of capturing multi-scale structure in a way that is specific to the particular graph. Um, and part of the reason I keep alluding to the Fourier basis is that you can think of these eigenvectors as the Fourier basis translated onto graphs. Um, and this is really useful because a lot of geometric ideas, a lot of ideas that we, we describe for Euclidean geometry can be expressed in terms of the Fourier basis for, two, for Fourier geometry and, and recapitulate in that space. Um, and since we have an analog of the Fourier for graphs, that lets us talk about some of these geometric concepts on graphs as well. So one example of this is multi-scale representations. Um, so um, as, as Marcus uh, described in, in his slides early on, there are a range of scales represented in entorhinal cortex, um, where you have different modules of grid cells that represent different scales. Um, you have the same thing in hippocampus too, um, where the very dorsal cells that you can record, the ones that are recorded most commonly because they're right at the top of hippocampus that are that's easy to get to, um, these ones have very small place fields. Um, and you can see this in the bottom left-hand corner here. As you record more and more ventrally towards the bottom of, of the hippocampus, the, the lower part of this red C shape, you get larger and larger place fields. Um, the scale is said to increase somewhat gradually as opposed to the scales along entorhinal cortex, which increase in these more discrete modular, um, this discrete modular shape. Um, so 
This gives us a way to think about multi-scale representations in hippocampus and entorhinal rhinal cortex, and we can map this eigenvector view of multi-scale representations onto it um, as well. So if we simulate a place cell that has a very uh, small field, um, then this is going to lead to a very precise representation of space. Um, and as I mentioned early on, when we're reconstructing a predictive map from many different grid cells or many eigenvectors, we're going to need a lot of them to get the map with precision. And the fewer we use, the more coarse a map we get. So in order to get this small place field that has a lot of precision, um, we'll, we can approximate this using a weighted summation of these of, of, of a large number of simulated eigenvector grid fields. As our simulated place cells get coarser and coarser, we need fewer and fewer grid cells to stimulate them. Um, we can downweight the high frequency components to a large degree because they're not contributing very much when we have a coarse representation of space. Um, and this is because this eigenvector basis organizes information according to changing spatial scales. Um, you have the very large spatial scales early on, which you can recombine to generate very coarse representations. If you want a more precise representation, you, used to, you need to use a larger number of them. Um, so a, a nice property of this, uh, of this model is that you can use the same eigenvector grid cell population to support a wide range of place scale sizes. Um, and this is consistent with the fact that you get um, the same grid cell populations projecting to different regions of hippocampus that seems to be encoding information with different scales. Um, so that's really nice. Um, this is also anchored to relational logic. These are learned from the transition structure, even though right now they're depicted over space. So it starts giving us hypotheses about multi-scale representations in these relational environments. Um, and um, one word that I'll, I'll use for this again, so I should introduce now, um, for this kind of reweighting and recombining of eigenvectors to form um, maps with different scales um, is spectral modulation. Um, and this kind of spectral modulation that I've showed is useful for generating maps with different sizes. This is great when you don't know a priori what kind of scale you'll want for your map, or maybe want to consider several scales simultaneously. That one representation to support them all. So another thing you can do with spectral modulation um, is to weight and combine these eigenvectors not to not to form static representations at different scales, but to form distributions from which you will sample. Um, so this is basically the same logic. You're going to weight your eigenvectors. You're going to sum them together. You're going to create some pattern over space. But now instead of just ending up with that pattern over space, we're going to use this pattern over space as a distribution from which we'll sample. Um, and this lets us think about how we could create distributions from which we can sample with different statistics. Um, we see a lot of activity in hippocampus that, that appears to be sampling from a representation of your, of your environment from a cognitive map. Um, I'll go into some of this in a little more detail later, um, but this is the, the motivation for thinking about um, hippocampal activity in, in terms of forming a distribution over space. Um, so these different lines um, show different weights that you can have on eigenvalues to produce different distributions. Um, so we see eigenvalues along the x-axis, and a weight of that eigenvector is depicted along the y-axis. Um, the red lines here are ways of weighting eigenvectors um, to create random walks that have different widths associated with them. Um, this is also called diff diffusion. Um, but if you're taking um, a strategy or a policy of exploration known as a random walk, and you express it in terms of these eigenvalues, these are the patterns that you'll get. This is how you rate, weight the eigenvectors in order to produce that. Um, in addition to um, changing the weights on these eigenvectors to get random walks that have larger or smaller steps associated with them. We can also change the weights on these eigenvalues to get distributions that have fundamentally different statistics. Um, so these blue lines are not just different random walks that have different widths associated with them. They are walks that have a different type of statistic. They're more heavy tailed and they're called levy flights. Um, they're also called super diffusion because they're like diffusion, but, but with bigger steps, it's super. Um, the, if you plot this in linear coordinates, um, you can see that a levy walk looks locally a lot like a normal distribution. It sort of has the same bell curve shape. However, it has a much heavier tail. Um, the, um, the, the blue part of the line is above the red part of the line as you start to look at more extreme values. Um, and if you sample from this uh, style of taking step sizes, then what you get is something called a levy flight, where you are following something that looks like a random walk for a little while, but then every once in a while you take a huge step to get to some other part of the state space. 
Um, and so this is um, this is work, I, I forgot to mention, this is work with Dan McNamee, uh, Matt Botfinick, and Sam Grishman. Um, Dan McNamee was the first author on this. And one thing Sam Grishman realized as we were like making these math models is that this is actually connected to a huge literature of levy flights um, in the animal foraging literature. Um, and these, these styles of exploring environments are seen in like all of these different kinds of exploration patterns. You can see them in albatrosses searching for prey, you can see them in foraging spider monkeys. You see them in humans looking at a visual scene. Um, if this is um, for humans that are looking at fractal patterns that they've never seen before. The reason they're hypothesized to be so ubiquitous is that they have good coverage time. Um, whereas random walks tend to dither, they tend to spend too much time in the same area and not move on to other areas fast enough. The large jumps that you occasionally take with a levee walk cause you to avoid repeating the same locations again and again. One nice thing about this formulation is because we've anchored it to um, these eigenvectors, which are learned from the transition structure, is we have a notion of levy flight that can be applied to um, environments that are not necessarily Euclidean, um, that, are, that are maybe relationally specified. Um, and this is because we have this notion of, of big jump that's anchored to something that's specific to the actual geometry of your environment and not just Euclidean geometry in general. Um, so in, um, in this example, um, we have a random walk in a four room environment. Um, it, and what you see with a random walk is not only are you visiting the same locations again and again because you're taking a random walk, but also you're very unlikely to randomly walk out of this room because most of the location, most of the transitions you can take don't lead you through this doorway. But if you have a notion of big jump that's anchored to the particular geometry of your environment, you have a notion of big jump that will take these doorways into account. Um, so in this case, you now get an agent that takes a big jump that propels it through a doorway, frees itself from the room, and it can explore this environment a lot faster. Um, so I think that's really the main upside of, of defining these in relationally anchored terms, is you're using geometry that's specific to the actual environment that you're in, rather than a more general, uh, a general geometry that could be refined further. Um, so one thing that Dan also realized is that we can use this model to explain um, different types of sampling statistics that are observed um, in different cognitive states. Um, so one example of this, um, this activity that is thought to be sampling from hippocampus um, is this spontaneous reactivation you see in hippocampal data. Um, so what spontaneous reactivation is, um, is this. Um, basically, what hippocampal activity usually does um, is what uh, Marcus described early on. Um, you see um, activity that's consistent with representing your current location in space, uh, both in the, the hippocampal cells and in the grid cells. However, sometimes when the animal is at rest or just kind of hanging out or grooming itself or eating reward, then you see this spontaneous reactivation um, where distal states that the animal is not currently at are uh, active in hippocampus. Um, it's very like evocative. It looks like the animal's imagining things that it did before, but isn't doing now. Um, interestingly, you will also see this kind of activity during sleep, um, where you see the spontaneous reactivation of states that the animal has visited, perhaps in the, the last day, but the animal is, of course, unconscious and not currently experiencing them. Um, it, this is hypothesized to relate to consolidation, to the kind of strengthening of memories that, that uh, is hypothesized to happen while people are asleep. Um, but of course, uh, I think it, it's not really known for sure. Um, so there was this data from Stella et al, um, which showed that the statistics of spontaneous reactivation during sleep were different from the statistics of experience when the animal was awake. Um, so the, the experience was more consistent with super diffusion or these levy flights. Um, this isn't surprising because this is the, the animal foraging pattern that we're familiar with. Um, but the pattern that you saw during the spontaneous reactivation while the animal was asleep looked more like diffusion. Um, so this is cool for a couple of reasons. One of them is that it seems like this reactivation is not just recapitulating what happened during the day. It's not just sampling from experience because it's got different statistics associated with it. Um, and it's also interesting because it suggests that the same architecture can generate samples that have different statistics that are varied in this particular systematic way where you can turn superdiffusion into diffusion. Um, this is something we can do with spectral modulation. Um, so that's, that's uh, kind of exciting. That's like one way you could generate this. Another thing you can generate with spectral modulation are these minimally autocorrelated um, samples from your distribution. Um, so 
Um, basically, you can reweight the eigenvectors and recombine them to form a sampling pattern where the consecutive states you sample are unlikely to overlap with each other. Um, and this is consistent with the kind of uh, activity you see during hippocampus as the animal is approaching a decision point. Um, you see this, um, this sub-second cycling between representations of possible futures, it's like left, right, left, right, left, right. Um, and this is consistent with sampling um, states that don't overlap with each other very much because your different futures are unlikely to have overlap with each other. Um, so this is also something that could potentially be generated with spectral modulation, um, and, and that's kind of neat. Um, so there's a normative story about why you would want these different sampling modes um, in different cognitive states um, and, and why we should really like go through the effort of having a unified system from which you can sample with different statistics um, in relationally specified environments. Um, and that's basically that different cognitive modes require different statistics of the samples that you're generating. Um, so as I mentioned, if you're exploring an environment and you want to cover it as fast as possible, Levy walk is your guy, that's going to be the fastest way to cover the environment. Um, and that's shown by this blue line up top, random walks are much less efficient, and so uh, are these minimally autocorrelated um, sampling modes. Um, the environment we're simulating is on, by the way, is this multi-cluster environment below. However, if you're looking to consolidate a representation of your environment that captures the structure, you don't really want to use a levy flight for this because the large jumps confuse the adjacency structure. If you learn a representation with TD on a levy walk sampled environment, um, you don't see clusters quite as well as you do in a random walk environment because these large jumps really like degrade the cluster structure. You're jumping between clusters and it, it doesn't expose as well how things are locally connected to each other. Um, and finally, if you're interested in covering the environment as fast as possible, however, you're not actually subject to the constraint where you have to walk among locations, um, this minimum autocorrelation sampling mode is really good for that, uh, because that's basically saying, let's sample as many non-overlapping states as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, if you're doing this in mental simulation, you don't actually have to traverse between these locations, um, so this minimum autocorrelation is ideal. If you actually have to walk between these locations, you'll spend a lot of time walking back and forth, and a levy flight is better for this. Um, so. Um, this work was recently published in Nature Neuroscience. If you're interested in more, you should check it out. There's more simulations. There's much denser math, um, all things people like. Um, I think the, um, one of the, the key insights of this work, as I mentioned, is that you can use these, um, these eigenvector grid cells to do something that is easy to define for Euclidean geometries, um, to, to sample in these different ways across space, um, and you can translate it to relational environments. Um, this, this like these, these eigenvectors are a really nice mathematical go-between between the Euclidean world and like the, the graph and manifold world. Um, so in this case, it permits us to have a multi-scale representation of space um, and define step size, which is a key property of these distributions um, for these different types of environments. Um, so I, on that note, I made this slide during Marcus's talk because I thought this dichotomy is really lovely and I wanted to go further with it. Um, this idea that there's one, a view that you could use grid cells for, for structured memory as like a scaffolding for acquiring new associations um, where you're learning associations between like a map and, and things that are bound to that map. Um, the second view is that grid cells encode information directly. Um, you have like a, a change of basis. You have grid cells that are capturing statistics of your environment. Um, certainly these eigenvectors are used for like learning clusters and representing the underlying low dimensional structure. So you can think of them in that way. Um, but I think one thing I'd wanna point out as, as a connection between them is that these, these eigenvectors, these representations that, that are derived from trying to succinctly capture the structure of a particular environment are also a really nice basis for binding things as well. Um, you can take a lot of the, the geometric Euclidean ideas and you can apply them to relational spaces if you have a representation that's anchored to the, to the specific relational statistics of space. One of the reasons grids are so powerful in our models of spatial reasoning is they capture these geometric principles, which aren't entirely absent in these other types of environments. You just need to use something that captures that particular geometry. Um, so I think this, um, this is more, most succinctly summarized is what you use to encode information is possibly what you should use to scaffold the rapid acquisition of memory. This is whatever's representing the 
underlying structure of your environment is capturing all the statistics you already know and want to take for granted and don't want to relearn. Um, so rapid memory is all about not relearning things you already know. And so this is kind of, uh, this is the main idea. The last thing I wanted to end on is an example, another example of old European art um, that um, is this time by Leonardo da Vinci um, that I think captures um, one of the reasons that like um, I, I'm so fixated on this idea of like generalizing these ideas to relational spaces. Um, and perhaps some of the reason that James and, and Tim are as well is that these relational ideas um, seem like they could potentially be really powerful for um, for for the kind of like creative compositionality that we think is important for artificial intelligence and, and regular intelligence. Um, so this is an illustration of a dragon um, that was in one of da Vinci's sketchbooks, and he accompanied it by this like really delightful recipe for generating dragons. Um, you take for its head that of a mastiff or a hound, eyes of a cat, ears of a porcupine, etc. All of these different animal parts. Um, you, you separate them from their natural context and you recombine them according to the, the, the statistics of how these parts should relate to each other. You know, noses and faces relate to each other in a systematic way. You could take a particular nose and a particularly different face and recombine them using this kind of relational logic. Um, so I think relations are, are not the only language of compositionality. Um, you can do geometric compositionality and, and generalization. Uh, you could use programmatic uh, compositionality, but relationals are really powerful, and we have this geometric way of describing them that I think is really nice. So on that note, I want to thank uh, my collaborators um, and various mentors, um, Dan McNamee, who did the spectral modulation sampling work, um, which you should check out in Nature Neuroscience, um, Jesse Gertz, um, who's a grad student at UCL, whose work I didn't talk about today, but is working on really cool stuff, um, and a number of professors um, and colleagues at DeepMind that I've worked with. Um, especially, you know, uh, Tim, because he's here and you can ask him lots of questions about that. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me and for your attention. The, the, the trick with screenshotting my slide was amazing. So thank you for that. <laughs> I was really hoping you'd like that. I thought you would. I did. I really like, yeah, I thought it was a nice dichotomy. One thing we've learned today is that Grid cell theoreticians are very articulate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need a control. I can't. I can't we... think there are many. I can't think there are many areas of theoretical neuroscience uh, with this amount, with this level of um, proficiency of, of presentation. <laughs> I think. I think that's broadly true. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. So I guess we're moving on to the discussion um, section now. And Marcus has a few roundtable questions first to lead us on. Uh, sure. Yeah, I could do that. Um, so do you think, but, go on. Do you think, given we've been going for an hour and a half, do you think people want a sort of three minute toilet? and Sure. Uh, and that, that, that sounds like a good idea. Like that. Yes, that works. Yeah. Cool. I'll, 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 I do. So I'll be back in three minutes. OK, let's regroup after three minutes then. For any of our audience who has questions, feel free to use the Q&A function on Zoom. You can just um, yeah, type in your question and we'll answer it. 
Okay, it's everyone ready to hop back on. Yes. Okay, cool. I think uh, I think we're all here. Um, so, I mean, I, yeah, I, I guess I'll bring up just a couple empirical things about grid cells that I just want to see if people have thoughts on, things that puzzle me, uh, and I just want to see what people think. Uh, so these, I'm actually going to use some um, deleted, some slides that I deleted from my presentation as I was cutting it down to size. So uh, first of all, one of the things that puzzles me about grid cells is, uh, are, is distortions. And um, here I'm showing a picture of, of a two by, two by two meter box. And like, if you, if you really start to look closely at the fields, the, the firing fields of the cells, over here, the scale seems to be like larger than it is over here, the distance between them. And I mean, there seems to be slight changes in the orientation. And all in all, I'm just not as impressed with the regularity of this grid. And a simple two by two box, uh, and, and this, puzzles me. And I'm curious what people think about grid distortions. Uh, for when it comes to like, I mean, like, like if you have a, a, if you're forming a spatial map, ideally you wouldn't want something like this. Uh, so, uh, so um, I, I, I I don't know quite where the question's coming from. I think that like, mechanistically, there are good explanations of these grid distortions um, because of uh, them being uh, tied to some, some part, being tied to the sensory wor world in, in interesting ways, which causes the attractor to bend and that kind of stuff. And there's a whole heap of yeah. uh, work on that. And so I think we understand quite well why these distortions happen under the various different models, and Kim showed you some of them under under the eigenvector model as well. Um, uh, I think that um, if you want it as a metric, uh, then the question isn't given. We know that biology is is biology. Uh, the question isn't um, is this metric um, is this not a metric because it's not distorted. Because it's distorted, it's the following: it's is behavior distorted in the same way as the grid cell, um, and uh, as in when people are asked to do dead reckoning and that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, in the in the limited occasions when that's been measured, it seems to be true that behavior is distorted in the same way that the, that the grids are distorted. And so uh, the argument is that it's still being used as a metric, even when it's distorted, and then this behavior goes wrong. That's 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 the that's the argument that's made by the spatial proponents of grid cells. Yeah, I think I think that makes sense, especially with anchoring it to the behavioral distortions. Um, I guess you you kind of said early on, like that doesn't seem like something you'd want for a spatial representation. Um, like it it might actually be something you want for a spatial representation. There's if if one location is likely to be rewarded, um, then you might want to be like have a metric such that if you're doing dead reckoning, you're more likely to veer towards it or something or away from cliffs, um, a kind of distortion that um, that takes into account like the geometry of experience as opposed to the geometry of like actual physical space um, might be either good or just like a tolerable amount of error that doesn't matter that much. Um, I'm kind of re-saying what, what, what Tim has said, but, um, but I think that's sort of how I think about it in this way. Okay, so, so I'm hearing, yeah, maybe it's like a mix of, a mix of A is behavioral policy kind of shifts it, and B, it might be just kind of a bug of attractors, and that it's a bug, not a feature sometimes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, the reasons. I've heard other models too that, that I think are, are basically the, the one that Tim mentioned first, that just like, depending on what you're anchoring your representation to, you have different certainty and and resolution at different places if you're like exactly. trying to infer your allocentric location relative to something that's over there it's going to get noisier and maybe larger as you get further away from it um and um that might be fine because you've got a whole bunch of grid cells that all have different um different types of uncertainty that they're um they're juggling <laughs> 
I mean, yeah, there's also, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's many arguments on this line that, that, about, that um, uh, the hacks of solving problem in biology uh, can lead to errors. And so the relevant question is, is, is going to be, do, do the errors get passed through into behavior or not? If, if you're saying, because obviously then machine learning people, if they can think of a way of doing without the errors, should do. Versus, um, uh, is it really useful for the brain to have these warp representations? And Kim's example of, of rewards is, is an interesting one. Is an interesting one. And then you have to, I mean, like we're, we're in this game then where, I, so like I just to maybe divert this conversation slightly on this point, like Kim's final point, which is that the um, uh, generalization argument and the uh, Eigen argument are, are can be can be coordinated with each other is is well taken except for the fact that mostly the eigenstructure of two of two different worlds is never exactly the same and so you now need a a, a way of and so and in, in this example that she's just given what kim's has given where there's a reward in one place is a particularly cool example of that the eigenstructure of the policy uh, to find a reward in one world will very 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 seldom be the same eigenstructure required to find it in another world. And so then you have to decide, well, do I warp my grids or do I have new bases that can sort of linearly add to the transitions around here? Um, and there are, there's lots of fun uh, research to be had in, 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 that, in that situation. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think the, the, like, the, key, the key kind of takeaway is, that I like out of these models is that like, it's important to have a representational basis that captures as much structure as possible, but keep separate the, the things that you don't want to necessarily pre-compile, the things that you want to have the flexibility to like recombine in new ways. Um, having some separation between the, the, the basis that you combine to form geometric structures and the where location is, re like where reward is located within that space makes a lot of sense, like ways to like efficiently represent that. Um, I think Tem like moves in that direction. Generally, these like meta learning models, I think, are like a given, nice way to think about structure learning. Given that this is um, brains at bay, there's there's um, well, given given that we have three people in Europe talking at brains at bay, it might, might be worth bringing up the two uh, two science papers uh, that came up on the same that were published the same day. One from Stanford and one from Austria and Europe, which just showed the exact opposite result of this. And and um, it, so the Chichvari lab one shows shows that the transition structure can warp the grids. So the, the grids move their field when the reward gets in place. Whereas the... Um, Will, Will Butler, Kia Hardcastle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Lisa Jacomo one shows that the rewards, the grids do not move. And it's really uh, telling, I mean, this, this is a clear example of what uh, Kim and I are saying. So in the in the behavior in the in the um uh Tishvari paper they're, they're just running a set of predefined transitions all day and that will warp the grids but in the Giacomo paper they have context they have a context which says forage around randomly and a new context which says uh go straight to the reward and in that situation you don't want to warp your grids right because you'll always go straight to the reward you want a situation where you can flexibly move between some grids that are and in that situation now you need a, a set of bases that you can add on to your grids not uh, not a warping of the grids and so those are the um, yeah so that's the kind of uh, dichotomy that's being discussed yeah Cool, thank you. Uh, I'd rather not dominate this with my questions for the group. Uh, people can feel free to ask questions of each other and uh, maybe I'll come in later, but we have other people with questions as well. So uh, I, I forego my second question. Okay, should we address some of the questions in the Q&A section then? Uh, I think that James, so James, have... and Kim, James and Kim and I speak really regularly to each other and, and often oh. have the chance to, to ask each other questions, but however, However, we never do ask really aggressive questions of each other, and so, <laughs> so I think we should. Do, I think we should take the opportunity. Can, Bring it. <laughs> I will immediately crumble. <laughs> no, let's do it. What's your question, Tim? Kim, what's your, what, what do you What do you hate most about Tim? Kim? What do I hate? Oh wow. <laughs> Um, that it was hard to understand the paper. 
<laughs> I think that's that's maybe a, a bit of an evasion. Um, yeah, I, I don't I. I, I don't know. I mean, I thought it was cool. I, 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 it's in keeping with a lot of the things that I think are like um, interesting to model at hippocampus. It moves it in this meta learning direction, which like for a while I've wanted to be done and think this is a really nice way to do it. Um, I think, yeah, that's, that's probably my, um, if, if I had to, to pick something really, really aggressive. I don't know. What do you hate most about my model, the eigenvectors? Uh, I, so again, I think they're great and they've moved everyone forward. I also, I, I, so I think that the fact that they have to, you have to, uh, the fact that you have to experience the whole world before learning all the eigenvectors means that the, um, uh, means that the transition, means that you lose some of the benefits of all the, uh, all, all mm. the, uh, so the, there needs to be some way of inferring uh, what's going on yeah. in those eigenvectors rather, rather than learning them. I, I, I think there's an interesting question that we could debate about uh, the role, about whether, how hippocampus interacts with reinforcement learning in general, uh, mm -hmm. which is so, like this one, it seems like there's a set of another way of, di of dichotomizing the um, uh, the recent models on on grid cells or on hippocampus in general are some of them some of them try well try to model uh, like states and um, uh, and values or predictions uh, which which enable values um, and others. Um, try to just model sequences and, and capture the statistics of sequences. And um, so I, I wonder whether, whether you could say that uh, hippocampus doesn't care about reinforcement learning at all, leave that to stray term, but hippocampus sort of tries to copy the, the sequences that stray term um, is building or something like that. It's like generalizing mm -hmm. or, or making, yeah. Yeah, I do. I do think this is a really this is a really interesting question to discuss. I guess I think I don't really know. I mean, the the way that I have like liked using reinforcement learning is I think it's a nice way to anchor like a, a formalization of kind of autonomous learning. Like it has some of the it has some of the challenge. It sets up the challenges of of learning nicely. Like um, if you're if you have a specific notion of relevance, which is equal to your reward. Um, then is that enough to generate a learning process? And, and like, if not, what's missing from it? Um, and I think that's that's like really nice, but I don't know to what extent, like, I mean, none of the representation learning logic really requires reinforcement learning to be downstream of it. It's just like, if you have some uncertainty about what you're gonna be learning later on, what yeah. can you learn now? Um, and there's just assumptions at both of those levels you can make to like scaffold stuff along. And I, I think you probably agree with that because we've talked about it before. Um, in terms of like, if hippocampus is doing reinforcement learning per se, um, I mean, I don't really know. I mean, there, there's like, there, it seems like there's stuff that dopamine can do that has an effect on hippocampus, like in terms of um, stabilizing memories um, or, um, or changing like which sequences are um, are generated during spontaneous reactivation, um, but like this whole like cognitive map logic, the whole idea of it is that you are representing something that is like um, capturing information that is not just related to reward. Like if you have this episodic logic where it's trying to represent episodic memories, the relevance of which you don't yet know, it's trying to capture details from which you're, you haven't yet generalized. The whole idea of it is you should be learning things that aren't necessarily, have, that, that haven't necessarily proved their relevance yet um, and representing a map similarly that you should be able to like generalize to new things you haven't learned yet. So it's almost like, you could think of it as like anti RL in a way because it's representing the stuff that like, we we wouldn't have thought reinforcement learning would really like cauterized. Um, I don't know. How do you yeah. guys think about it? And you too, Marcus. <laughs> so I guess one one yeah one one question I have with the eigenvector one, and as I'm trying to learn to think about it, like 
one statement I made in, in, in the slide you uh, screenshotted was that the thing we all agree on maybe is that um, the grid cells are used for uh, um, and, and, and you know similar cells are used for representations that you can update. And, and I found and I found that um, or I find that with your work, sometimes that's the case and sometimes it seems less the case. Uh, when, when you're with your sequence generation, it absolutely seems the case. Um, with the with other stuff, it seems more like grid cells are performing a change of basis on something else, and then they're just they're doing that so that they provide some useful information. You've you've changed the basis, but they're not there to be updated. Uh, and I'm curious if my logic there is right. Like, am I right that some that you're not as focused on updates in some of your work? Yeah, I, I would say like in the. I think in all the work they the, that I did, they could be updated, but it wasn't like their purpose was to be updated necessarily. It wasn't like they're always um, forming this like binding role um, that I think is more that they're that they're there to be updated. Um, like I think the um, if I had to like make a like a, a guess that's consistent with this work on why they're there, it would be like to represent structure in a way that supports some efficient process downstream. Um, as, as best as I could model at the time. And I think the um, the ability to be updated is sometimes part of that, but it's like, it's subservient to that more um, more like main normative concern. Um, does that does that make sense? Yeah. I guess uh, I will bring up a, se a second question without bringing up a slide with it. I'll just say like, Recently, um, the Moser lab had a had data where uh, they used neuropixels, recorded many, many neurons, uh, and, and recorded a single grid cell module. And they reached the conclusion that it forms a, a torus, like the, the rhombus I was showing. Um, and they, they even reached the conclusion that it's like always using that rhombus, like whether the animal's sleeping or if it's, um, or, or if the grid is distorted, it still sort of forms a rhombus. Honestly, I'm not sure I totally believe that. You could come up with other explanations where in sleep it was actually the average of a torus with something else. I don't know if it's actually true, but I'm curious, like, uh, does that fit with, really, uh, um, you know, kind of both of both of your models, uh, I think, involve a lot of switching of what the entorhinal cortex is doing. If you move away from 2D space, if you move away, move to family trees, I'm not sure you'd expect these toruses anymore. Uh, and similar with, with similar with Kim's work. I'm curious, like, do people have thoughts on that? I can maybe Neil James can take that first, then Kim. So, so, uh, well, I'll go first then. So, so I think so. The first question, your first answer question is we don't know yet. So I agree with you that the Moses data is exciting, but not at all compelling in the use of the word all. Like we don't know what happens in a task that isn't spatial in those th in those things. Um, so I'm hoping that we're going to find know the answer to that question in about three months' time because we we have a task we're trained up, and we have a neuropixel probe in, and we will um, uh, so we, we we have them in non-spatial tasks uh, and measuring grid cells in space and non-space in the same animal. So hopefully, so and so. Here, so that's the first question. I agree with you. We don't know yet. The second question is, um, uh, what would Tem do first, and then I and then I think Kim can answer after. But I think she might give a similar answer. So uh, vanilla Tem right now in a task that's embedded in space, where they still have to do a spatial. Re spatial part of the task, but I have to do something non-spatial in space. Remember, it's a mouse. Everything it does is all it does is move and lick, right? So any task that you give it is in space. It it still has to know space, and so it it is going to try to learn something which knows about space and the task. If you if you give it that, um, if you give it just one version where the task is always in the same spatial locations, then that, then it will learn a sort of combined version of of uh, space and the task, which will all be warped. There won't be grid cells, won't be a torus. If you let it learn the the, the same conceptual task, uh, 
in lots and lots of different locations, then it would factorize space from the task and it will have some grid cells and some task cells. That's what vanilla TEM will do right now. If you, there's a, we've now got hierarchical versions of TEM which impose these kinds of interesting factorizations and, uh, and we'll learn much, much faster because obviously for it, it, learning to factorize would require a lot of data, but you can obviously impose these kinds of things. Say most of your life is embedded in space. And so you should have these kinds of factorizations and learn other things on top of it. If, if you can split your problem into various factors, then you can do much more rapid generalizations. And so uh, James is working on that at the moment with, with um, and, and got some interesting kind of results with, um, with um, some, a master student of his, or else maybe James should have answered that question. But, but, um, but yeah, so it's gonna be, I don't know. So I, I'm gonna be interested to know what happens to these non-spatial task elements in, on, on the Taurus, but I don't think that you can say that these ideas wouldn't predict grid cells in those things because a mouse's task is almost always embedded in space. I, I guess Kim is going to say something similar to that. <laughs> James, um, did you want to chime in with anything first or did, did Tim eloquently capture your thought? Oh yeah, I was just reading my mind. <laughs> cool, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm going to say something similar. I mean, I, I think that it, um, yeah, I don't think, I, I could think about this in like terms of some of the, the ideas we talked about. I don't think it's something my, my model like um, predicts exactly. Um, I think one thing that um, this also reminds you of that's maybe worth mentioning is there's this work on um, like default representations that um, Karan Pere and Nathaniel Dov worked on um, that, that talk about like um, how you could relate a default policy and an efficient representation of that default policy with representations that are more task specific might be interesting if if we think about these more toroidal representations as as belonging to a default because so many tasks are naturally embedded in space um, that might be some some framework for thinking about like why you'd get sampling behavior that like relaxes to that um, while the animal is asleep um, yeah, I was also, I mean, I guess the question you're wondering is if you're doing a task which has no spatial elements in, in it, um, do, uh, um, do you, uh, do you um, uh, utilize, reuse this entering representations in some way, or um, you know, do grid cells change uh, to represent that task, or do you, does another, you know, the brain's much bigger than entering, of course, it's, um, just it says some other part of the brain represent um, that task while entering a cortex just sits around and do it, does nothing. Um, I mean, I don't know the answer. At, at, um, at all. Uh, I don't know if anyone else uh, does either. Um, but that, I mean, that's entirely a plausible hypothesis as well. If 2 d or something analogous to 2 d is so entrenched in a trinal cortex, um, that it's another part of the brain that, that, that um, learns the structure of the other task. I, I think that's totally conceivable that uh, the entorinal has branched forward into, uh, has grown, particularly in humans, has grown beyond its capacity and and uh branched into um like parts of the media can i ask marcus a question uh definitely so um I, I feel like yours is the sort of um standout idea that um about using grid cells for another question that i'm really interested in but i haven't thought of using grid cells for before and so uh, i'm done some work on compositionality before uh, how and um, how to build maps out of uh, and so I, I was really interested in in this idea that you could just use grids uh, and effectively sort of store all the pairs of locations all the and and so in in uh, and it seemed like what you were what you were storing them with is the um, is some memory in hippocampus of some of the object vector cell code it's, it's, is that what you're i couldn't roughly out. roughly uh the, it's not the object vector cell because it's uh changing with the animal's location is not a good thing to store uh you want to store the relationship between two things that are out there not the relationship to, between me and the other thing so so mm -hmm. so it's going to be something external uh so so it was actually displacements between object vector cell i see yeah yeah 
the space in between already set the vector cells measured at any one time where the displacements are measured by the grids, which you can obviously you can just read off the displacements of the two different grid codes. So it, I had sort of a number of, so it's an interesting thing, this. Um, uh, it's an interesting thing because that same system does solve compositional problems um, uh, as well as, uh, um, and scene construction problems as well as um, uh, navigation problems. And so it's clearly amazing if you can do that with exactly the same representations. I think the first thing that I would question is that means that you have to effectively sequence out all pairs you because you can't mean you can't represent two things at at once in the grids right so you're going to have to sequence out all pairs or you're going to have to know which sets of pairs to sequence out to to give you a robust enough set of pairwise things to make a map is is that right yeah, so I guess there are two parts where pairs come in. One is that, like, uh, just make sure, making sure I'm covering everything. Um, object vector cells, you want to, you want something that can detect the displacement between them. So that's kind of a pairing approach. But I think what you're asking yeah. is, like, the learned thing, the learned data structure in the end, um, is it a big graph where everything is connected and you have to learn every relationship? Or, uh, or, is, it, uh, or is it something else that's more efficient than that? Um, and in my mental model, at least when it comes to something like SLAM, like learning environments, it's it's a it's a big graph that is kind of sparsely connected when, it, when it comes to learning and, environments. I see, but you still gotta have, yeah, right. And you, but you're, you're gonna you're gonna have to, the only way of building that graph is through sampling, through sequencing, presumably. So is it that's right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is potentially um, a potentially a, how you how you do these compositional problems. So so uh, cool. So the second second question I was going to ask was, okay, well let's say these things are really grids and and you're really placing them in a. So that that means that you're limiting yourself, doesn't it, to um, one not knowing about the kind of commonalities that Kim was talking about in her dragon, lovely, lovely dragon example, which I, I'm going to use for compositional reasoning in the future, um, uh, which which is that you you know where heads go, they go above necks, and so the statistics of that should be in the grids, not in the not in the memory, um, and the um, and and the uh, I, I I would think, which means that the thing, the structural knowledge can't just be two D knowledge that you put into this compositional reasoning, right? It has to be some much much richer relational structure than than grid. Whenever I think about this, I think that it's that it's the kind of relational structure you want there is the kind that you want in language, like like a really rich relational structure uh, to allow you to do compositional reasoning. I I, I would have guessed. In the same way that, that you know the statistical relationship between words, you also do between concepts. Yeah, um, the, the way I, at least in my current mindset, the way I'd go about getting more of that flexibility of what can be learned, like heads are above bodies or whatever. Um, you know, my real answer is I don't know how to use grid cells for that. The these displacement graphs that I'm talking about, like the object vector cell graphs, in a sense. Um, I think I can do it with, uh, in my mental model, it works with that and associating information with edges. Um, when, when we come to these more flexible versions, it's more, rather than using these very um, discrete or very rigid displacements, not spatial displacements, but allow it to be more of a, like a learned thing, like a learned relationship, a learned quote unquote displacement that really is more hand wavy. That's, that's how I begin to uh, address this, is so thinking about graphs where the edges are learned and the edges are really kind of flexible in what they can mean. So that's that's how I begin to address that. Uh, why grid, where grid cells fit into this, I don't know exactly. Uh, for me, grid cells, at least uh, grid cells in the cartoon view of them, they're useful when things exist like in the real world, when you have one instance of it, but when you get to something, some kind of flexibility like that, I don't know what to do with them yet. I mean, I, I think something like grid cells are, are going to be amazingly powerful in that in that um, in, in that problem. 
but they but the statistics they're gonna to have to capture are much richer than the statistics of two-dimensional diffusion. Yeah. If, if I can speak up, I hope you don't mind, Jeff Hawkins. Uh, I'm somewhat familiar with Marcus's idea. And uh, we've been we've been working on uh, the idea that in the cortex, throughout the cortex, the same uh, basic mechanisms are being used um, for modeling everything in the world, just as the mechanical complex models think. And um, in specific of the model Marcus proposed, I've been trying to map this onto cortical anatomy and the specific uh, types of cells in physiology we see there. And if I, if I understood your question, Tim, I mean, I may not have, so, but I think you're asking how do we keep apart the separate underlying structure from the specific knowledge about uh, a memory of yeah. a particular environment. And in the details of Marcus's model, there are different cell types representing these things. The, the nodes, the nodes of his graph are not singular. There are multiple cell types in those nodes. And as I've been working through this, it, it feels like you can, you can infer just by structure uh, or you can infer by the specific instances. But I think it's compatible. I think what Marcus has proposed is compatible with that idea, if I understood your question correctly, and I may not have. Um, and I, it gets into the details of the model. But I agree with you that, that you have to be able to, which I thought some of the speakers eloquently explained, you have to be able to represent the underlying structure independent of the details that can be applied to different in, in different problems. And you also be able to remember the details and you have to be able to infer from either direction. Um, and I don't want to speak for you, Marcus, but I think his model allows you to do that. Would you, is that, was that a fair assessment, Marcus? <laughs> yeah. But the structure, but the structure is assumed to be 2D space. Is the, is the, no, the I, don't, I don't think that's, I think that's, that's something that really tripped us up for a long time because uh, we, we assume our models of the world assume that we don't, if we think about the neocortex, we don't want to assume that it's even three dimensional space. We, we rather assume that the cortex figures out the, the, the dimensionality of the things it's modeling. And, but let's assume it's 3D. Um, and, and we've never really got a good way of doing that with, with grid cells. It just never really, really worked very well. And we, we went through all sorts of uh, gyrations to try to make it work. Um, but I think the idea that Marcus is proposing which is really the modeling is done in sort of the, uh, the polar coordinates, the object vector cell types of, of cells. Um, that is amenable to many dimensions. You, you, don't, that, you, you might think a rat might be believing in a two dimensional space, but the, the actual mechanisms, I think that underlying that could be any dimensional. So yeah, three dimensional. And, and just, and, yeah. and those, just so I understand those polar coordinates, is that, is that different from, it, are you imagining that's ego, that's an egocentric coordinate space so that you can so you have the whole parietal to play with or are you I mean is I was surprised I thought you were gonna I didn't think you were gonna say object vector cells when you said them because they're still allocentric uh, and in map. Uh, all right, I I I I should just say vector cells in general. How about that? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I I wasn't being specific. Yeah. Um, so what there are. Marcus? Well, I was just going to say, I, I did intentionally choose object vector for these models, these learned, these learned graphs, because you kind of want those to be allocentric. They, uh, they are in other cases, but, okay. but you yeah. also have other representations that are not allocentric. In there yeah. as well. So um, anyway, I think going back to this very interesting question, with grid self seems to be two dimensional and, and the world is not two dimensional. And so we have this problem. I think one of the nice things that Marcus came up with is, and, and I don't think we've worked it through. I don't maybe Marcus has yet, but I haven't understood it yet. Um, in detail is that the, the, the grid cells are there really, one way to think about it, they're there for path integration. Uh, they're there to help the, assist the model. The model is not in the grid cells. The model is in the, op, in the vector cells. And, um, and yet you really can't do path integration well with those. So you can, then, you, then you have this subsystem that's really the grid cells, which are sort of saying, hey, I can assist you in path integration. Marcus showed this sort of three-way thing I call the flux capacitor. Um, which says, you know, maybe a two-dimensional path integration is sufficient to assist the three-dimensional models that are done in vector cells. But why wouldn't you choose a, a, a path integration in 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 whatever in whatever? Space I would have. I would have. But but I, I'm not sure the empirical evidence suggests that's what happened. Okay. Um, I, really, I, I, honestly, I wasn't making a statement about path integration in 2D versus 3D. I was, I was just, you know, introducing a, a set of ideas using 2D ones, and I, I'm just not making a statement about 3D right now. I, I'm not either, but I, I've been struggling with the fact that, you know, and Marcus knows we've had a lot, a lot of conversations trying to figure out. Well, we need, we need 3D dimensional, 3D path integration, and, um, and it's not clear how grid cells do that. 
Um, it's also, I mean, it's the, it is the case that Ilafita, for example, has models of, of, of how you might do um, high dimensional. Yeah. Yeah, might and, and maybe they'll be right. Uh, I was a, I was a co-author on that paper. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so maybe that's right, right? But um, um, but uh, we don't know. So, um, but I think the nice thing is that the Marcus proposal it separates out these two worlds. You can say, okay, there's a path integration component, and then there's a model component. And the path integration component could be 3D, could be, and there's a lot of other, there's other weird things about grids though that, that bother me that, you know, there's some fact that they, they, they realist, uh, reliably don't fire in certain situations, certain positions at certain locations. Um, and we don't have an explanation for that. So there's weird stuff going on that we just don't know. Obviously you guys are the experts on that. Um, but I think the idea of separating out path integration is a separate from the modeling component. And Marcus, I don't want to speak to you if I got that wrong, please correct me. But that seems to be a really interesting idea, which to me was like, oh, that could explain a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that's the bulk of it, other than like the other pieces that I'm still storing the grid location of the objects, even though it's ambiguous, it still is useful to have that. But that is so not that, the, you're storing it, but that but that's helps you to key back into the into the path integration system. It's not yeah. the it's not the location of the thing we're storing. It's not like what the, the basic idea is you're storing these relative positions of of objects in. Uh, we, we've kind of known that had to happen for a long time, but we didn't have a mechanism that really, we, we proposed one in our 2019 paper, but it, uh, yeah, but, uh, but it wasn't, it, it had holes, it had problems, it didn't work. This is the displacement cells. <laughs> I see Kim is raising her virtual hand. Good, yeah, I, I, I had a question that's, um, that's kind of like an alignment type question. I think the, if I'm, if I'm understanding it correctly, I think you're talking about um, using grid cells to represent uh, pairwise relationships between things, like the the displacement between things, which you could use to build like a pairwise structure, um, like which which is what what graphs are. So I think um, it seems like the the grid cell models that that Tim and James and I have talked about is like how you would learn uh, to represent the structure of uh, what I think you're calling a model. These like pairwise relationships, and you're talking about using grid cells to represent path integration within the the space of that model. Um, so they would be like, I think in your model, it's like, how do you represent the edge information? And in our models, it's like, how do you represent the, the graph structure? The, is, is that how you guys are thinking about how these models relate to each other, these like different hypotheses? Uh, quick thing, I'm wary of the time since we only have five minutes left. So will everyone be okay like staying on for like five or to 10 more minutes and then we can just wrap this up? I, I I can stay for um for another half an hour if you don't mind me cooking while I I'm, I've got to go and cook my dinner. So if you don't mind me cooking while while I talk, then that's fine. Yeah, we have a team meeting actually at noon, so we have to go too. Uh, Kim, yeah, what what you said uh, seems like a, a good connection, and I'm my mind's in a similar space as I as I look back at both of your work, uh, like and try to reapproach these questions. Do you think there is were there, any is there any? Were there any burning questions from the audience that we should answer in, in the last five minutes? Or I think we have one question that's the most upvoted, which is: Could you maybe elaborate a bit on how Tem works and learns in general? <laughs> so on a higher level, do you need specific learning representation structures to learn these grid structures? Yeah, we can. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, my explanation wasn't 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 good. So Tim, Tim, take over. I think. I mean, what it's doing is it's it's trying to learn a, a representation which satisfies two properties. It's trying to learn to make the same representation every time it comes back to the same place so it can retrieve the correct memory, that's path integration. And it's trying to learn to um, make representations that are very different from each other at different places so it has an efficient uh, so it can access that memory efficiently. Those are the only two pressures on the representation in term, on the grid representation in term. And those two pressures are sufficient for grids, for object vector cells, for all these interesting uh, uh, um, state representations in um, uh, in uh, in um, the final things that he said. But at the end of the day, there's really those two pressures driving term. And you can actually build James has built an interrhinal cortex without everything else 
just using those two pressures and it can recapitulate the same representations. Um, so I think that probably is clearer than, than reading the whole paper, maybe, yeah. Thank you. Yes. And another question we have is, why do you think the hippocampus and ethereal cortex is in a specific location of the brain rather than being distributed throughout the neocortex? Uh, I mean, anyone can't, uh, I, I mean, I feel like I'm gonna. I don't know, I was gonna say it's like Tim's theory <laughs> that it's like very central and gets inputs from everywhere. Sorry, I stole that, but um, it's very, uh, Multimodal, it gets inputs from everywhere. It has a core central position. I have a, so, I have a question. Needs a lot of core, core, core padding to, to, for injury. Well, we've, we've, we've argued that. The we've argued that same basic. The question is not why, why, why the physical location. The question is why, why isn't it? Why isn't it distributed throughout? What, what's? I think mm. you're you're being asked what we're being asked. Why isn't every cortical module like? Uh, I mean, in this, like how what we think of as the hippocampus enterorhinal, that which I think is what Jeff Jeff's model suggests, and would be amazing if true. Um, uh, and we're being asked, why isn't that true? So, Kim, why isn't that true? Yeah, sorry, that was a <laughs> slightly harder question. I mean, I think the um, uh, I don't know. I mean, the, the the classical theory that I think most relates to this question is the complementary learning systems idea that like hippocampus is specialized in a particular type of fast, rapid acquisition of new memories. Cortex is doing a, a slower, um, more like um, generalizable form of, of learning, that it's it's learning patterns more gradually and not trying to rapidly acquire but, but the that's, specific but particular that is, of a new But that's not, that's not inconsistent with using the same basic mechanisms, right? Sorry, sorry, so yeah. sorry to interrupt. Sorry. It, it could be, that could be, you know, one thing you see a lot in the hippocampus, you see a lot of these uh, sort of silent synapses that are, uh, and the, the pyramidal cells here have a huge number of 30,000 synapses on them. And um, that would be very suitable for very fast learning where the cortex, you wouldn't want to do that. So it could be the same base, I, I believe is the same basic mechanism of working everywhere, but you wouldn't have this as fast as learning in the cortex. But um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful system in general, right? Even though we don't understand it completely. But the, yeah, I guess it depends if you call that the same, if, if that's the same or not. Cause I well, guess, it, yeah, if, if you'd see, there was a paper out of China in January, I can't remember the uh, Wong and someone, you know, they're not claiming they're seeing grid cells in the primary sensory cortex. I, so I don't um, think you should rely on that date. So I think I understand, should, but but we, 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 should be we, careful, should. we should be careful about what's a grid cell. But the but the um, I, we should also quickly return to Kim's initial point about what makes a memory and what do you want to remember fast? Because there is like a fundamental difference between something that re, that is that knows about a part of what's happening now, as in a cortical column, versus something that can make a memory that can go and reactivate all of cortex to recreate the experience of now. And hippocampus really historically has been about episodic memory, not about navigation. I and mean, that's how we found out about it. And the reason people are excited, the reason it's interested in episodic memory is, is it, can, it can remember a whole episode. And that's for that, that reason that, that Kim was saying earlier, is it gets this extraordinarily influx of connections which which come from all parts of cortex and are combined together with these very long uh, axons which go all the way up hippocampus and combine things that seem to be that, that, that you could never bind together in cortex right you could never buy like if the situation now I need to bind together my schema of understanding a zoom call with the fact that I'm on Jeff Hawkins is buddy over there with 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 the X Y Z and and that all has to make one memory and then you can sequence out those experiences and then you have to partition those you have to partition the relevant parts of that experience to into the relevant cortical regions for learning and and so there is something different about hippocampus about hippocampus from a cortical column in that it has access to the whole experience, which cortical column doesn't. However, that doesn't mean that the same mechanisms aren't useful for learning part no. of an experience. I, I think that's, I think that the argument is it's the same basic mechanisms and, and, and I just don't yeah. disagree that the hippocampus is an amazing place to do, you know, these things. 
you know, it's just like something like I have knowledge about my computer and where every key is and where the ports are. And so is that stored in the hippocampal complex? Is that stored in the, in the neurocortex, right? Um, uh, I have knowledge about mathematics. Is that stored in the neocortex? Is that stored in the hippocampus? So there's got to be no, a no, lot no, of knowledge no, no, that's no. stored in the hippocampus. All of your cortex. semantic knowledge is, is, all of that is semantic knowledge. That's all stored in cortex. But when you combine it to make a memory of using maths on your computer keys and pressing a particular button, that yeah. memory is stored in hippocampus. Well, fine. So, but there, there is structure to my computer and that structure needs to be represented in some sort of graph like uh, or some sort of metric system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. We all agree with that. Yeah, so the that's all. I, I think, I think there, it's just, it, it's, you know, the, it's interesting. It's, it's now looking like the similar types of mechanisms exist in birds and their blob sections and things yeah. like that. So I think the question of, the, of the, 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 the audience member is, you know, why don't we see similar structures throughout the brain? I think actually we're going to see them throughout, not just the mammalian brain. You can see them throughout other, any animal who can sort of do any kind of path integration, any kind of knowledge, any kind of episodic memory is going to have similar mechanisms. Likely, it's not proven, but likely. Uh, so they're all, you know, related mechanisms. Anyway, it's hard. Yeah, I think so. I think I think that this general idea of separating out structure and tying it to experience is a powerful one. And I can see Jeff and Marcus's argument that you could use that very powerfully as part of a cortical column. I, I don't think there's I, I mean, I'm, I, I'd like to see to see instead of so. Here's what I would say to the S, this S one argument, right? There's grid cells in S one. So, two, two. My two criticisms of you, use, you using that argument, Jeff, are as follows. First, it's a data. It wasn't my argument. I just said that was a recent paper. Okay, but but like you have just. Oh, I have said yes. I, I've said that. I think that the cortex. You're going to see the sim similar. Yeah, but so different. so if you're going to see grid cells in S one. And if that's evidence for your model, which I think would be, if your model is true, I'd be like celebrating, it'd be amazing. It's like a beautiful way for the brain to work. It, it, if, then those grid cells in S1 would not be as a function of the animal's location. They, oh, would, be as, as a, yeah. they would be as a function of the thing that S1 is doing, which is about the, the, the I don't know, whisker location or the, 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 well, the, the it, grid cells. It's, it'd be a bit both. It's like, you know, grid cells in the, in the anthropomic cortex aren't just about location either, right? If we, so you've illustrated it, they represent other things too. Ah, but no, but they are, no, no, no. They're about the animal's overall experience right now, which in a rat is really location, but in a human playing stretchy birds is about the bird, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas in, in, there's no way that S1 knows all of the current um, uh, experience that the rodent is ha having, right? No, the but it, it's, it's the argument is that that S one knows about where a patch of retina is, and a patch of retina is like a mouse, a rodent, and so yeah, exactly. The, so then, if you were to plot the grid cell, so if that were true, if that was V one, then if yeah. you were to plot the grid cells there, then they wouldn't map out a grid as the animal walked around space. They'd That's right, and I think, I think your, your, your program, the, the paper out of China, which said that, and I, and I agree that's a problem with that, if that's what you're arguing. Yeah, yeah. so I, I'm not gonna put much weight in that. Um, I think it's interesting to find out how that paper came about. What did they actually measure? You know, what are the issues there? But I, I, I was mean, surprised by that too. I wouldn't expect that, the, that you wouldn't expect to the see the same. Thing, the key thing about that paper is just that there's only ever, they haven't got any, Example of a cell with more than three peaks in it, and yeah. the odds of finding the odds of finding if you just have just have so, three random. So let's let's just dismiss that. I mean, I mean the, the beautiful paper that you know you guys worked on the fMRI experiments with with uh, humans, just amazing. Um, you know that was showing prefrontal cortex and grid, uh, grid like structures, and so I think we'll see over time. But I, I I'd be very surprised if we don't see. A continuing theme of these basic mechanisms throughout the cortex. It, it just makes sense that the brain has to model things, and this is a modeling system, and it's unlikely it'll be different, fundamentally different modeling system. It's possible, uh, but it's unlikely. So uh, I'll, I'll shut up here. <laughs> I'd be excited if it were true. Yeah. Okay, I'm aware of the time, so I guess we'll wrap this up. So yeah, thank you for such a productive and interesting conversation. Thank you, Kim, James, and Tim for sacrificing your lunch and dinner time to join us. And also Marcus for presenting. Um, for the audience, we weren't able to go through that many questions. So if our panelists have some time, maybe we can address them via email and we'll post them on our websites.
And yeah, thank you for everyone who joined the meetup. I'll post the recording link on our meetup page as soon as it's uploaded, probably by tomorrow. And hopefully everyone has a great day and we'll see you next time. I, I like to also just thank once again the speakers. I think as, as Tim pointed out, it's amazingly good talks. Uh, so we have been around. Really, 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 really lovely. So thank you, Bill. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you very much.